Good morning, everybody. I'm Ty Lee, uh, the chair of this committee on designing a strategy to evaluate the fifth national climate assessment. Uh, I'm delighted to see uh, the people who are here in person uh, in the room and, um, <clears throat> uh, and glad to see the people on the screen who are joining us uh, virtually. We have a busy two days. Uh, that we're starting and uh, we'll, we'll have uh, some, we'll be, I think we'll have, we hope to leave uh, tomorrow afternoon uh, with uh, the report largely, uh, the architecture of the report largely uh, set for us uh, to, to move forward. So that's an ambitious uh, goal that, that's going to be, um, that we're gonna have to uh, work collaboratively with each other on. As we well, uh, we will, you know, we're gathered here to think about or to gather information first from the USGCRP, uh, from the previous evaluations uh, that have been done, and to touch base with a, a couple of the stakeholder organizations that will help us to get a perspective. I think on uh, perhaps the most difficult question: Who is the audience of the NCA? Uh, we're going to try to cr craft a report structure, organize ourselves into subgroups to write uh, the different components of that uh, report. Uh, we'll try to identify issues uh, that are in front of us. Uh, and I think uh, boldly tomorrow, we want to come up with some preliminary conclusions and recommendations. Uh, so get ready to be uh, to draw conclusions, uh, or maybe jump to conclusions is the right way to say this. Um, as we begin, I wanted to uh, call on Stephen Stichter uh, from uh, the Board on Atmospheric Sciences and Climate uh, to explain a little bit of how this committee fits within the structure of what the National Academy is up to. Stephen, would you say a few words? Great, thank you, Kai. Um, greetings, everyone. Steven Stichter with um, the Board on Atmospheric Sciences and Climate. It's telling me to join audio and just a reminder to everybody when you're it's when it tells you to do that, you can ignore it. Um, and um, we appreciate your um, your time and your effort uh, that you're spending here and over this year to uh, move this forward. Uh, the Board on Atmospheric Sciences and Climate is responsible for a wide range of of um, topics and disciplines um, related to atmospheric sciences, from atmospheric chemistry, through observations, through weather, um, as well as climate. Um, Kai mentioned uh, the collaborative work that needs to happen in, uh, in this committee and um, representing that. Uh, we almost all of the climate work that we do is in collaboration with other parts of the National Academies. So we're um, pleased to be able to do uh, be partnering in this in this study with the Board on Environmental Change and Society in our uh, division on uh, behavioral and social sciences and education. Um, Brad Cheney is um, with the um, with both. We have two partners in, in DBAS. One is uh, the Board on Environmental Change and Society, and second, the um, Committee on National Statistics, uh, which Brad is um, a member of the staff there. Um, so when we, we appreciate what you're doing. I wanted to give a little bit of a grounding for some of the connections for this work. Um, the Board on Atmospheric Sciences and Climate and BECS um, have been supporting the U.S. Global Change Research Program actually since before it existed. Um, so we provided, the National Academy provided input on the um, development of the Global Change Research Act uh, of 1990 um, and provided ad hoc uh, support for USGCRP from its inception. Um, and then since Earth, since the about... Um, a little over a decade ago, there's been a formal advisory committee to the to the National Academy uh, to the USGCRP, supported by uh, BASC and BEX. Um, we uh, in that work we provide advice and guidance to USGCRP in its global change work, and then um, their their mandate is in the process of being expanded to also encompass services as well. Um, we have also, in conjunction with that work with USGCRP, uh, provide uh, 
external reviews for the National Climate Assessment. Kristen uh, was uh, is on her second uh, volunteer uh, commitment in a row, uh, first having com uh, participated in the recent national uh, external review of the national draft national climate fifth, fifth national climate assessment. Um, this project right here that you all are participating in is one that we have started. We started talking with USGCRP in about 2018 about getting this going. And some things just take time. And um, so we're really pleased that this has um, is underway and um, look forward to the results of your work informing not only um, a follow-on assessment um, that is to be conducted, and, but also um, USGCRP is in the process right now of standing up a federal steering committee for the sixth national climate assessment. And so the kinds of guidance and insights that you're providing about how to think about users and uses and consider um, the uses of the national climate assessment will be taken into account as they are planning for the sixth national climate assessment in addition to its implementation in a in an actual assessment of, of the fifth national climate assessment so thank you again for your um for your contributions your volunteering for this activity and uh, really excited to see what comes out of this meeting and also the guidance that you're providing to usgcrp um, going forward for the National Climate Assessment and all of their assessment work. So thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, and to members of the committee, let me uh, just <clears throat> remind you uh, that, that once we have our guests in the room, uh, I'll ask you to go around and introduce yourselves very quickly. Uh, name, affiliation, uh, perhaps what area of interest you have with respect to the question of um, evaluation uh, and the Nash and the NCA five, uh, but that that will come uh, that will come a little bit later in the morning. Let me turn now to uh, first to introduce Brad Cheney uh, <clears throat> from the National Committee on Statistics, as um, uh, uh, Stephen mentioned. Uh, Brad is here as a staff <clears throat> person who has considerable experience on evaluation. Um, and uh, he's, he's certainly been very helpful to me in thinking about uh, how to frame the, uh, the work of this committee. Um, and he'll be with us uh, all through the, he signed up for the duration. So we're gonna, uh, we're gonna have him here. Uh, you've all met Hugh Walpole <clears throat> and, uh, and, and also Lindsay Muller, uh, who's in the corner. Uh, Hugh, I wanted to ask you to say a few words about uh, basically the process going forward. Um, uh, when will be, when do you expect will be done? Uh, what are we going to do uh, between here and there? Absolutely. Thanks, Kai. Um, so there's a couple of, of touch points, I think, that uh, are worth us thinking about um, for this meeting today, just because we have a, a great deal to do and, and not an enormous amount of time to do it in. Um, and so I think it's it's worth thinking about our short-term goals in terms of assembling um, the report. So one of the things that this meeting was designed to uh, help us support was putting together and finalizing the outline that we have for the report to give us a, a roadmap to go forward and a structure to build around. Um, and so one of the um, one of our tasks is to to go through and look through that document that we've put together um, in the previous uh, few weeks. And there's been a lot of really good conversation on that uh, over the last few weeks as well, but I wanna make sure that we have an opportunity to finalize that. And then in support of that, we'll also be dividing in during this meeting into um, writing subgroups. And so uh, different groups that are responsible for different parts of the report. So once we've finalized the report structure, we'll be able to split into those groups and discuss some of the key issues that are uh, kind of dominating some of those different parts of the report structure. And all of this is in service of uh, some kind of short-term goals in terms of our timeline. Um, and so our plan is to ideally in a meeting, in a virtual meeting that we'll have in late March, um, to have a sort of finalized draft that we can put together for the evaluation design. So it's a relatively short period of time that we have about a month to gel on some of these issues and use that to support putting together a strategy that we can be comfortable with. Now, it doesn't have to be perfect, um, but it does have to be uh, in a, a, a structure that we're comfortable with um, as we move forward to making some of those recommendations. And this, again, is all in support of uh, hopefully 
by the middle of April, having a full draft report that we'll be able to work on editing and getting ready for a, uh, a process of going into our external review process in May of this year. Um, and so again, there's a lot to do in a relatively short space of time, but it's a really, really good group. Um, we've had so much engagement from all of you already, so I am fully confident that uh, after we come out of this meeting, we'll be kind of walking tall with a set of marching orders in terms of how we're going to put this together. And so I'm I'm fully confident that we'll be able to put together a really great report coming out of this. And Kai, please let me know if there's anything else you'd like me to cover in the meantime. Happy to do that. Well, that's I think that's a good that's a great sketch. Um, what we have uh, a question that we want to take up tomorrow when we go through the outline of the report and see how we feel about it is uh, a question that, uh, as Ariane put it, that every undergraduate asks, how many pages are we trying to write here? Uh, and that's a question I don't want to raise. I don't want to I don't want to explore that yet because we don't uh, we haven't had a chance to talk to each other about the full outline. That's just a uh, coming attractions. Uh, <laughs> All right. Uh, any other, let, let, let me just pause here to see if there are questions that people have uh, about what's been said so far. Uh, uh, and so that we can, before we uh, start focusing on the guests, we'll have uh, later this morning and early afternoon. Any questions? <clears throat> Stephen, wh while we still have you, I don't know how long we'll be, you'll be able to stay with us. <clears throat> um, a question that, that came to mind as you were talking about <clears throat> uh, what BASC does uh, in collaboration with the, the other committees and boards. Uh, is what perspective you might share with us, uh, <clears throat> having worked with the uh, committee to advise the U.S. Global Change Program uh, for some time, uh, what perspective you might share with us about what, we're sh what we should be doing uh, in this report. Um, I say that because uh, reading the summary of Heather Dansker's uh, earlier evaluation, what struck me is... Um, the, the durability of the issues with respect to evaluation that have been raised. Uh, the same questions we've talked about amongst ourselves in our, uh, in our online meetings uh, are there uh, in, that, in that evaluation of the third NCA, that's three NCAs ago. Um, and, and so uh, I, I wonder what, what help you might provide to us about uh, why this what set of questions that that are in this our statement of task, uh, how they came to be, and and what you think USGCRP is ready to hear and to act upon? Um, so two parts of that: how they came to be. Um, those all of our work is um, as we're scoping out our work. We um, we do that collaboratively with with the sponsors. Um, so these do reflect. Um, both insights from BASC and the on the physical sciences side of things, and I'm, I don't want to draw draw too too firm of a distinction between the physical and social sciences because it's really built into what we we do throughout BASC um, that the social science how we actually move the information and knowledge that we have into practice um, is is baked into what we are doing. But um, so it was a collaborative discussion between BASC. BASC and BEX and USGCRP. Um, so it does reflect the kind of information that USGCRP um, over a course of years. So as I said, the first time that we proposed moving forward with this was around 2018. Um, and just through funding, more getting the funding in place um, took a while. And um, but those, so these that the, those questions came from collaborative discussions between the national academies and USGCRP. Um, I think that there are one of the things to know about 
US GCRP and Glennis knows this deeply from having been in the midst of it is uh, US GCRP is a coordinating body. Um, so the actual work, uh, there are some things that they actually implement such as the National Climate Assessment, um, but much of the work of US GCRP is um, really trying to get, as they call it, uh, coalitions of the willing together um, of finding agencies and groups of agencies who are willing to pool their resources and their um, and their attention um, to specific issues. Um, so one of the one of the challenges that they have, and it's a um, I think it's a positive in the end when uh, when the work um, is is completed is that they have brought together agencies to do um, to to move forward on their goals. Um, I think that uh, one of the things that we may hear from Allison is uh, simply that the National Climate Assessment is a beast to move forward. And as over time, it has grown in size and the number of participants and authors. Um, and um, so I think one of the, even the challenges, the desire that they have for, for moving forward on some of these questions around um, how how it is implemented, how people are engaged. I think we some of the engagement questions. If you look at the fifth national climate assessment and the number of authors and the range of authors, um, I think we've seen them move in that direction. And yet, I think there are just some practical and logistical challenges that they're they're running up against. But I think that the work that they're doing, for instance, now of having just released the fifth national climate assessment. And they are already moving forward on the the federal steering committee uh, for the sixth is first meeting in March, and um, they are looking to have a director for the National Climate Assessment on board um, this spring, um, which is faster than they've been able to do it. So I think they are set up to hear some of these questions and and have some extra time to hopefully move forward with them. Um, I would, Allison Crimmins is a phenomenal resource and um, you have an opportunity coming up very, very soon to speak directly with her and I, um, she's not afraid of hard questions. So I encourage you to use that opportunity to hear directly from USGCRP. Questions for Stephen on this. Because uh, I think an undercurrent, Stephen, of, of our conversations within the committee uh, is a sense of uh, that we want to question this. Uh, the easy answer is because climate affects everybody, the National Climate Assessment should address everybody. Um, uh, and and uh, the, the secular trend over the last five assessments since the 1990 has been in fact to expand uh, the audiences that people are trying to reach out to. Uh, I think there's some skepticism in the committee, in this committee about, about that. Uh, that's of course up to the agencies in the USGCRP to decide, but raising those questions is something that I think we are inclined to do. So I just, uh, and, and, and that's something that I think we need to talk about within the, you know, the committee, the committee's mind is by no means uh, uh, clear on this. I just wanted to identify that as a theme and ask you, Stephen, if uh, uh, about about your about your perception. You watch this more closely uh, over a longer period of time than any of us uh, have done, uh, except for Glennis, I suppose, who's who's been who's been watching this all along. But this is something that's that that I think we're going to wrestle with in the next couple of days. Um, yeah, and I, a couple of um, comments on that. Um, first, I know having had Allison in a in a different meeting yesterday uh, related to the U.S. Uh, the advisory committee, um, she is aware that some of these questions are coming to her today, and so I think um, she, she's poised to have a really robust conversation about the users of the National Climate Assessment. Um, so that will be. Great to hear that directly from her. Um, I think you also are coming from a very unique, you are a specific perspective, which is evaluation and bringing that, bringing those those questions about the users and uses and the 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 challenges or the that are posed by not having a clear framing for those users. Um, I think that's very much falling within what you were asked to do is about how do we do an assessment of those users and uses. So 
speaking to the the limitations or the challenges that it presents by not having more clarity around that is feels very much within uh, what you're asked to to speak to. Um, I there are some clear audiences within the legislation uh, for it is the it is the the document that uh, federal agencies use and reference uh, when they are bolstering and re referencing work on climate. Um, and so there are, there's a clear audience there, but I think the question of how to make um, this massive, massive effort and really important document meet a broader audience, I understand that um, that pull, um, but that's a that's a tension that I, I think you're you have a good opportunity here to talk specifically with USGCRP and also to point out the downsides of that, of being too broad or challenges with that, specifically within the context of trying to evaluate whether this document meets those the needs of those users. Good, thank you. That's that's I think that's helpful. Uh, and for those on the committee who have not been uh, involved in the work of the uh, academies before, uh, we also have multiple audiences to be thinking about. Um, we are uh, addressing the USGCRP, which uh, formulated the station, set, set, statement of task. Uh, be, behind them, that, as Stephen said, they're a coordinating body. We're also addressing the agencies uh, and, and the agency representatives who work on the NCA. Uh, and uh, it's not unknown for academy reports to uh, to get the attention of the Congress and stakeholders uh, on questions like that we might raise about the, uh, the levels of resources that should be devoted to evaluation. Um, so we as we as we get into thinking about the outline of the report in the next couple of days, uh, we want to think about multiple audiences as well that that we are addressing um, and and how we want to, we just want to be aware of that, I think, as we as we go into it. Stephen. Uh, one more comment just about the multiple audiences. I would say, I would also note that within USGCRP, you also have multiple audiences. You're asked to talk to the National Climate Assessment, and yet USGCRP will themselves be very clear in saying they have not generally done a very good job of, or they have not been consistent about building monitoring and evaluation into their programs broadly. Um, we had a conversation at the advisory committee in the fall around climate services. And one of the questions that they asked the advisory committee to help them think through was, as they are stepping into climate services, how do they think about building in monitoring and evaluation from the start. So your charge is specifically to the National Climate Assessment, but one of the multiple audiences that you, who will be reading your report is folks within USGCRP broadly about how do they think better and from the inception of activities of building monitoring and evaluation into that work. Great, thank you. Glennis? The charge does mention the National Climate Assessment and other USGCRP Great. products. Great, thank you. I, okay. You've read that more deeply than I have in, in recent times. So you, you, can use those, you can use those entrees to speak to those broader audiences directly. Great, okay. Uh, Hugh, are we ready to bring our guests? Absolutely. If there are no further questions, I'll just run and grab our in-person guests, and then we'll begin letting uh, our guests into the Zoom as well. So uh, brief interim for just a moment while I go grab them. Welcome. This is uh, <clears throat> there are no assigned seats, so you can just uh, <laughs> perch where you yeah. perch where you want to. Good morning, Allison. Welcome. 
Hi, everyone. Yes. Okay, welcome uh, to Heather and to Allison Quimmins. Uh, before we get started, uh, I wanted to go around the room so that the two of you uh, know who we are uh, as, as members of this committee and that we have a couple of members who are uh, online uh, as well, not here in person. Let me begin with them so that uh, you you see them uh, you see them at the outset since you're not going to see them in person. Michelle, let me start with you. Sure. Hi, hi everyone. Um, Michelle Meyer. Oh, I am unmuted on my computer. We're still Can't not hear hearing you. So. Uh... Okay. Let me ask Aruj. Yeah, let's maybe. try Aruj to see if if she is. Uh, uh, Hi everyone, can I, you hear me? Yeah. Okay. I think we can hear you. Good. Okay. So maybe take it back to Michelle. See if she she's still. Can no, you go can hear me now? Sorry. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Good. Oh, Great. good. Okay. Something something released. Um, apologies, Aruj. Um, Michelle Myro. Uh, I'm a senior information scientist at, at RAND. Nice to meet you all. And apologies for not being there in person. Aruj. Hi, everyone. Good morning. My name is Aruj, and I am an assistant professor at Loyola University Chicago and really excited to be here as well. Great. Let me just start with Ariane, and we'll just go uh, spatially around the room. Good morning. Ariane Pinson. I'm with the Army Corps of Engineers. Kristen. I'm Kristen Tim. I'm a research assistant professor at the University of Alaska Fairbanks. Scott Califatis. I'm the deputy university director of Northwest CAS based at the University of Washington. Jessica Kronstadt at the Planetary Health Alliance. Hello, Glynis Lowe, Aspen Global Change Institute. I'm Kathy Segerson. I'm a professor in the economics department at the University of Connecticut. Good morning, Carlos Rodriguez Franco, Forest Service Research and Development here in DC. Matt. Hi, I'm Matt. Well, hi, I'm Matthew Gribble. I'm the Associate Chief for Research in Occupational, Environmental, and Climate Medicine at UC San Francisco. Stephen. Stephen Stichter with the Board on Atmospheric Sciences and Climate at the National Academies. Uh, Brad Cheney with the National Academy is part of the Committee of National Statistics. I'm Hugh Walpole. I'm an Associate Program Officer uh, with the Board of Atmospheric Science and Climate, and I'm the Study Director for this project. So uh, I'm just helping the committee coordinate. Hi, Ann Gallagher. I'm with several institutions, and I'm an interdisciplinary person on this committee, so I cross all sorts of exciting boundaries. I'm with the Park Service, and I'm also with Old Dominion University. And Lindsay Muller uh, <clears throat> is in the corner there, uh, making sure that we can be seen and heard. Heather, welcome to you. Uh, would you say a few words of introduction? We've already re uh, read some of your previous work, so we're glad to have you here. Thank you so much. Um, so I'm Heather Dansker. I am the founder and principal at Dansker Consulting, sole proprietorship. Uh, it's consisting of me and my partners who I bring into various projects, um, largely focused on program evaluation. I'm based in Arlington, Virginia, and I'm so happy to be here. Thank you so much for the invitation. Um, let's see. So, okay. Yes. Okay. Next slide. Actually, you can stay, you can keep it there, but I'll give you a little more background on who I am and what I do. So, um, I've been in business focusing on program evaluation, working largely with federal partners and federally funded efforts. Um, and I've been doing that for 
11 years or so. Prior to that, I was in management consulting, working with federal agencies for four years. And prior to that, I was uh, in a research extension uh, dual role um, at a land grant university, Cornell, my alma mater, um, focused on both uh, doing systematic reviews in a lot of cases and then also doing the communication. And in that case, it was around chemical risk and human health. Uh, so I've had a little bit of a dual career in the sense that I come from both the social sciences and the physical sciences. I worked in chemical risk and toxicology for over a decade, and but I've also parlayed that with looking closely at the social and human dimensions um, and eventually have transitioned away from chemical risk to focus on program evaluation, and I'm, um, I'm enjoying it tremendously. Um, since I've gone independent, I have... Uh, led teams or worked independently um, across a number of fields. I originally, and for many years, even decades, considered myself firmly in the environmental space. But of course, that's uh, that term has evolved, as we know, with, with the challenges associated with climate and how uh, broadly underpinning those are to really everything. So I work a lot in sustainable ag these days. I also work with USGS. I work with many parts of USDA, both internally and as an external evaluator on, um, on large uh, multi-institutional uh, research initiatives at universities. Um, I also did a stint, interestingly, uh, for the Defense Security Cooperation Agency and the Deputy Undersecretary for Policy, DOD, during the COVID era, um, where I led a small team well, we were the evaluation methodologists um, as part of a much larger interdisciplinary team with defense subject matter experts looking and conducting three different high-level strategic evaluations that were uh, mandated by Congress to DOD as part of the Evidence Act. Um, so uh, there's a lot to say about knowledge management, of course, and I'm guessing that our discussion will will flow into that kind of um, arena as we go. So enough about that. Uh, next slide. Okay, so just an overview of what I'm gonna do here. I'm going to talk about the guiding questions that are on our agenda um, to keep in mind. However, my presentation does not answer those directly, but rather it's just a reminder to all of us of what we're here to think about and consider. And I will be touching upon some of them. Others I think are out of the realm of what I can speak to today, but I'm gonna present those so we can have them in our, in our brains. Um, and then, so my team uh, back in 2016 was uh, commissioned to do a retrospective evaluation of the process, the development process, and the products of the third NCA, as you probably know. Um, that was, uh, I put, I had multiple partners, New Knowledge Group and uh, others that were subcontractors to my team. Uh, total about 15 people over the course of about 11 months. Um, I'm going to talk about that process of evaluating the process <laughs> and its products um, from the standpoint of the, I think what the questions that are of most interest to this committee, which are how did that go? What are the questions and how 10 years later really, or eight years later, do we think about evaluating um, different aspects of what the Global Change Research Program creates, that, that climate information, that climate knowledge, those products, including the NCA report itself. Um, I will, it's hard even for me, and I think for a lot of others, to actually separate that from thinking about what the NCA is, how it's made, what it does. And of course they're related, but I think we don't wanna get too far the, down the path of what we found. That's, that's, that's many years in the past now. I can speak to some of it from my memory, um, but we won't be focusing on that. Um, instead, I'll be highlighting some of the strengths and challenges and limitations of our approach and then in and taking that into thinking about considerations for evaluating the NCA and and I use that holistically as the products of GCRP 
and its partners um, going forward. Next slide. Okay, so I rearranged these questions that are at the top of our agenda, and I see them falling into several buckets and to help us kind of parse out what we're really thinking about here. We're thinking about the evaluation of the NCA, and of, again, either broadly or narrowly, either the report itself or that larger universe, universe of product. Um, and so we want to know about what some of those challenges are. Um, but I want to think about that broadly rather than narrowly. And um, we're interested in the types of stakeholders, partners involved in evaluation, which is separate, I think, from the question of who are the audiences for the report? And I have seen in past, and I'll get into this in more detail, but I have seen in past uh, outputs that sometimes I think that gets a little bit um, uh, conflated, understandably, but I do want us to think about the users, which in the uh, evaluation world is how we really think about people who interact with valuation products are users and often primary users. And then, so thinking about maybe, and that's maybe a, a way of easily separating this from thinking about the audiences of the NCA report and other products. And then this broader question even of that larger climate information universe, um, <clears throat> there's this question of sources of climate information that users are using, <laughs> that audiences are using, <laughs> and, um, and are there gaps there? And that's a broader question that I don't think I can answer. I have not studied that. I, I'm hoping some folks have, perhaps at universities and otherwise, um, certainly an important question. Next slide. Okay, so a little bit about um, our process. So we, the as you many of you may know, there was a workshop back in 2014, around the time of the release of the third NCA, that um, brought together over 70 folks, GCRP folks uh, and others, to think about how to go about evaluating uh, the NCA. The NCA report, the NCA process, development process use were all considered in this. Um, and the report has a nice, it, it really contains a lot and I, I, I think it's still very relevant. I read it again last night and um, I think that it has a lot of good ideas in it. Um, so I, I would not say it's dated. However, and I will, I will be speaking of this further, but I think there are, there are new frameworks for thinking that have emerged in, in the intervening years that we um, also need to consider. And I think those can help us um, even sort of bucket what's in this report. Good ideas, certainly, but I think part of it is we'll see that a lot of what's in this report are the finer grain details of the types of questions we want to ask and what we are interested in looking at. But I'm going to lay out um, a framework for thinking about that that, that uh, makes it a little easier to think about. Um, Appendix G in this report had a list of all of the types and buckets, if you will, of types of questions um, that that this workshop yielded in terms of things to think about. It, it, it turned out to be a pretty suitable framework for our task, which was to consider and evaluate the process of developing the NCA and then also its products, um, because that's essentially what this um, workshop and and this uh, the, the framework that's presented in Appendix G, that's really what that, that allowed for. It did acknowledge that there are larger questions and I want, I'll get to that. So the uh, arrows here in green are really the sections that we focused on to capture and assess in our work. Um, included thinking about the structure of the development process, what it took to all the inputs and resources that went into it, what writing and review looked like, how communication and group dynamics, uh, what they looked like in this very large um, uh, uh, process that was very interdisciplinary and brought in more external stakeholders than previous NCAs. Um, what kinds of benefits um, came out of it for the, the developers themselves? And that's an important thing actually is, there's a limited 
uh, arguably a limited set of scientific expertise in climate science. We don't want to burn folks out in this regular process. And so how, what, what benefits are there for that continued participation, which is uh, basically unpaid and takes a lot of work. Um, and then the dissemination and access and, and the application outcomes of the report, that was really tough and I'm gonna get to that because it involves getting the information from the users and how we did that and I'll speak to that. So next slide. So the methods we, um, we approached it, from a mixed methods utilization focused approach, which is really utilization focused evaluation is very commonly used approach, which means that the, one of the primary premises of it is that you, you identify the evaluation team and its, uh, and its partners identify early on who are the primary users of this information? What, what's, this, what's the purpose of this? And at this time, the purpose was to learn how it went to have some lessons learned for next time. And so those users were largely uh, GCRP itself, the NC State Climate uh, Institute for Climate Studies, the, the technical teams involved, and of course, any others of the external stakeholders and partners that were part of it at the universities and other groups that may be interested in, in learning from that, being part of that. Um, like I said, it was focused on the process and the products. It involved two different surveys of both developers and users. Um, the user's survey was um, one of the challenges. So we ended up using the GCRP's um, newsletter listserv. And that was approximately 5,500 email addresses. We got very low response rate, very low. And so arguably so low that you need to really question what the findings were from that and put those in context. We did get representation and we looked and calculated um, and analyzed quantitatively representation across these data collections because that was one of our charges. And we did get representation. However, um, it uh, basically, we there's more to do on that front because the user group was still limited and we don't, we don't, we can't say that the users that responded to the survey are actually representative of the true user group of the NCA at that time. So limitations there. Um, that said, all of the data sets did inform what we were able to say about NCA use to some degree. Um, some of that came from, so alternative methods of looking at use were looking at uh, doing citation and content analysis. That is a time component to it. And I don't want to get too into methods because the methods really flow from those higher level questions of what your general purpose is for evaluation investment, uh, who's going to be involved in that, over what time frame, then the methods follow from there. So methods are not the starting place, but since we're on the topic, I will say that when thinking about assessing use, the, the time component matters because there's learning to be done in the moment of the development. There's learning to be done in different moments of, of use, but there's also learning to be done in the out years um, in, in ideally optimal, uh, the optimal landscape for when that product is being used before everybody moves on to the next one. Next slide. Okay, so like I said, I, I, there's so much to say, but I, I think uh, we're not going too far down what our results were. Instead, I'll just talk about some of the hot, very uh, highest level strengths, challenges, and limitations. And you'll see that inclusion, inclusion, inclusion. <laughs> A strength um, was the inclusion of both the process of developing it and in fact, um, that so many of those developers, and, and and again, I would say weaker on the side of users, but so many of the developers showed up to be able to inform our evaluation data collections. So the evaluation was in that sense inclusive, um, but the, the process itself was inclusive. Um, the challenges, like I said, were that identifying actual users in a way that we could have confidence was representing full use of the product was very limited. Um, the Also, I would say that the essentially post hoc nature 
of conducting a kind of tr trying to capture a lot of things after the process and after the release of the report um, has definite limitations. Time matters a lot. And in fact, when we conducted ours in 2016, that was already several years, even three to four years, depending on where people put in most of their effort um, into, into the development. Um, and for, for anyone, that's a long period of time to really reflect on the nuances of the experience. Um, again, underscoring the idea that there is value in what is called formative assessment, um, basically side by side along in that process for, for learning and process, process improvement. Um, limitations again were inclusion. At the end of the day, um, we still felt like there were, um, it was not as inclusive as it could be. One of the main takeaways from that was that uh, for disadvantaged groups and individuals, perhaps representing those groups, uh, even as leaders of those groups in some places around the country, they do not have the resources and did not have the resources at that time to engage. As we know, of course, post pandemic, there are more ways to engage virtually, which has helped tremendously. And yet um, it's important to still think about whether there are adequate resources to be able to allow for inclusion of, of uh, disadvantaged groups. Um, and again, like I said, doing and thinking about this as only a post hoc exercise is is a huge missed opportunity um, for for that kind of learning that could be really optimized uh, if if it is baked into the process. Next slide. So some considerations going forward, um, as I think probably most of you are aware. There's been culture shift for the better uh, in this area, in the area of thinking about assessing large federally funded initiatives and, and who's included in those. Um, there's, for, as of, I think, uh, 2019, the Evidence and Policymaking Act compels federal agencies, a set of federal agencies, I think those that fund with funding streams, to uh, really set up an evaluation uh, enterprise that includes evaluation strategies and frameworks and learning agendas. And I really wanna underscore learning here. This is about learning. This is not a, an audit. Um, people can certainly ask questions and people in groups can certainly always ask questions about uh, what bang we're getting for our buck in terms of federal dollars spent. But, but it's also really important to underscore that all of this is just about learning and improving uh, upon what the ultimate goal is. Um, which leads me to the first bu uh, bullet here, which is that embedding the evaluation into the NCA life cycle and thinking of that as a life cycle um, with these frameworks is really, I think, from what I understand, and I've not studied this closely, um, but what I understand is still something that needs to be uh, further developed. Um, I know there have been theories of change uh, and logic models that have been created as part of this endeavor that exist. There's, there's one in the workshop report. There are probably others. I would argue that those need to be looked at very closely because they can be very useful tools in clarifying the overall goals at any given time. And it can be an evergreen tool. Um, it does not need to be fixed in stone. It will always be evergreen as our challenges around climate information and responding to, to the decision makers in this country around climate uh, challenges evolve. Um, the difference for those of you who may not be aware with the, of these subtleties in evaluation tools, a theory of change is really a model. It can be narrative or graphically represented, but it's a model that illustrates the relationships between how you think an intervention is going to get you to a goal or a set of goals. And it is the logical relationships between those that are laid out. Whereas a logic model is something that is more finer grained to a specific initiative. And that can be in this instance, for, for, for example, used with any given uh, NCA report for perhaps, or other set of, or other constellation of uh, subject that you want to look at with specificity in a given more bounded time frame. 
Um, that is also something that can be evolved, but it allows for looking at specifics in a way that the theory of change illustrates essentially the logic of getting from here to there towards goals that need to be really worked out. And in this context, I think with um, adequate uh, open and stakeholder involvement. Um, so I think if I were to circle in red, possibly one of the most important takeaways that I have come away from since I've been thinking about this for, for today is the importance of uh, the development and prioritization of evaluation study questions. And, and really they tend to be sets of questions to optimize I'm, what I'm sure is a, a limited resources for evaluation investment. Um, I would say with all due respect that the initial evaluation workshop didn't quite get us there. It, it had a lot of great ideas um, and, and, it, and it has a lot of ideas for questions and aspects of the, of the entire enterprise to be looked at and inquired into. Um, but without, and, and that can help get the juices flowing, but there needs to be a process and a framework for thinking what is most like basically what are some of the big picture questions that matter here in terms of what these products are meant to serve and thinking about what buckets those fall into and then having a real prioritization process for what's most important to fund here that will inform and improve upon this system um, that i think might be a real top level recommendation here and of course, always there is the idea of, like I said before, who's going to be using the evaluation product for what purpose? Um, and, and that can help bound who's involved, because I know the question about who, the who, who's involved at any given step um, seems very overwhelming and, and again, kind of conflated with the audiences of the report itself. But that's one way to really bound it. It's like, who needs the information for purpose? Next slide. Uh, I think one back. Oop. Oh, wait, hold on a sec. No, I'm wrong. Okay, slide eight, I need. Yes. Okay. Uh, oh, I, I think I said, okay. So, excuse me. So, okay, like I said, formative evaluation. Of course, summative evaluation is also important, which is really focused on outcomes. Um, sometimes, uh, there, there are questions in this space around how is this impacting climate decision making? And there are arguments for and against look, doing outcome evaluation. In most cases, outcome evaluation is what matters more than thinking about the process and the, and the activities. Um, the, 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 I guess the arguments away from outcome evaluation are when you really do need to understand how a process is functioning and the contributional nature of the outcome gets really lost in the bigger space. And, and I think I've seen this, this is actually, I think Baruch Fischoff in the workshop report pointed this out that when you, if you are not trying to illustrate a causal effect, for instance, not trying to illustrate that the NCA report itself had direct impact on specific decisions in the US, but rather trying to illustrate its contributions to the ecosystem of decision making that gets hard, and are, some argue that gets diluted. Um, in other contexts of evaluation, it's very useful. Um, I think both are necessary and important to try to do. Um, but again, it depends on what your primary goal is for purpose. Um, so this is related to, um, and again, just one more note on the summative, which is. There are different contexts for thinking about impact. Um, there's the context of thinking about the NCA in relation to the, the larger climate information ecosystem, but there's all those, also those decision contexts that could be regional, topical, very time sensitive, responsive in nature, risk related questions and the science itself. Um, and so this gets us into the knowledge management space. Um, and there's these new ideas around that came out of the COVID area, actually, in terms of data management and thinking about how we take a sum total of knowledge at a point in time and then adding incrementally to it for efficiency and for rolling out of new information to audiences in ways that don't reinvent the wheel each time. Um, 
and are essentially efficient and allow us to get up-to-date information when we need it. And of course, with AI and the systems that are starting to emerge, I think this may become more possible. Next slide. Okay, and then of course I can't not talk about inclusion, diversity, equity, and these other important societal values. Um, there are others, I don't wanna limit it to those three. Um, these are, it's, it's essential to, to also keep those up to date and to build those and into the fundamental nature of the framework for evaluation and the learning agendas and the goals um, that these processes uh, seek to meet. Um, so the process of identifying and coordinating the stakeholders and partners um, are increasingly networked, as we know, that's one thing that um, is really emerged in, in these years and it's wonderful to see. Um, always more to do in that space, always more to, to grow and connect. Um, but these, let's see, um, essentially that coordination will not go away. It will always be there for different purposes. So it'll be there for thinking about the evaluation process as well as um, the sharing of the products uh, themselves and ongoing learning overall. And I'm gonna leave it there because uh, I think we have things we can discuss before my time may have already run out. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Heather. Questions from uh, the committee uh, and, and those who are online, uh, please, I guess what I'll do is I'll, I'll ask uh, <clears throat> Michelle and Arouge to raise their hands uh, in the Zoom uh, if you have, uh, if you, if you have questions, but floor is open. Go ahead. My question has to do with the slide with the seven buckets. You know, so you've got the, does everybody remember what that was? I, I just wanted to say before having read the assessment report, I didn't anticipate all those buckets how did you come to reach those buckets? Were you charged with all of the range of those buckets or were you also advised like a group like ours and those buckets came to be? Right, so those buckets actually um, are very parallel to um, what came out of the 2014 evaluation workshop um, and the appendix, it's in appendix G, it's online. Um, you'll see there's a lot of parallel um, those things are very parallel. We did have a process as part of evaluation with the, uh, so so we were, let me back up. We were tasked, it was our charge to evaluate the, the process and the products. There are other uh, frameworks and other sets of study questions we could have had. We could have gone a lot of different directions, but it was not our charge. We could have been charged with looking at the development of risk language, for instance, which is of course important and, and how users interpreted the language that the developers developed, right? Around risk and probabilities. That was not our charge. So our charge was actually looking at process and, and products. Fortunately, that workshop report provided a nice framework for that. And the team that we were working with, which was GCRP and the uh, North Carolina uh, technical team, Institute of Climate Studies team, um, we worked with them together and decided, yeah, this is a nice uh, constellation of questions that we are interested in looking at. We dropped a few, very few. Um, if you do a crosswalk between Appendix G and, and what we collected data on, it's, it's very few. We basically uh, included all those in both our qualitative and our quantitative uh, data collections. Kristen. Um, yeah, I had a question even in, in reading um, what we read before this um, meeting. Um, it felt like um, process was maybe like the larger chunk of what was evaluated and products were a somewhat narrower chunk. And so I just wanted to see whether you felt like that was the accurate perception. And then I was also wondering how much you thought maybe the the kind of constrained nature of the focus on products was a function of that period in time and just the the communication environment being a lot narrower at that point in time compared to what we see now. 
Yeah, I will agree that there was definitely more of an emphasis on the process. And that was sort of what was just agreed to by the group in terms of what the group was interested in at the time. I will say that there could have been other methodologies and approaches for investigating and um, characterizing use, certainly. I mean, the, um, you know, we did citation analysis. One could imagine sampling across that citation analysis, for instance, and then going deep qualitatively um, with questions around um, what the NCA meant to those users for as one example. Um, similarly, the GCRP newsletter listserv that was used for this, the user survey um, had a range of stakeholders, um, but, but the challenge there is that just because they're on the newsletter listserv does not mean they were had used the NCA. And in fact, I think that was one main reason why uh, we got a low response rate. Um, other reasons might also be that whatever email addresses were on that newsletter listserv may be institutional, for instance, and didn't go to individuals that might have had um, have been compelled to respond to a survey, for instance. Yeah. Kathy? Yeah, thanks so much for that summary. It's really useful. Um, you mentioned that uh, that Appendix G has the framework that you used, but you also mentioned that things have changed since 2014 and we've learned you know, new things. And so I was wondering if you could just summarize what you see as the key things that have changed. You mentioned a new emphasis or a, an emphasis on DEI, for example, as one thing. Are there other key things that you think have changed that we need to think about when we think about a framework? Now? Yeah, I, I mean, I think that uh, if you think about, let's think for a moment if, uh, about a hypothetical longitudinal system where we, we have a, a, a limited set of evaluation resources and we have to use them for purpose to answer key questions to make this all optimally functioning for the use of this climate information, right? So you might expect then to say, and say you're, you're allocated like we are with budgets um, to expend some of that over time in ways that are again, optimized. Well, I would argue that it was, it made sense to learn from a very large uh, complex development process. It was, it was the most complex development process involving many more uh, people over 350 people were involved in that process. It was unlike any previous NCA development process. So to focus on the learning from process made sense at that time. It may not make sense then to keep asking about process because some of these things we might say, well, it might be interesting to know how that's changed, but it might be more important to ask different question sets around, for instance, Again, like my risk example, like the the specific scientific and, and probabilistic information that these scientists are bringing to the language that gets that lands in the report matters to users. And looking at that closely could be a really important uh, set of study questions that you could still come up with methods, both qualitative and quantitative, to 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 inquire and, and you know and investigate, um, but I do think that the emphasis on use and and how this is getting, but, but not just use, but like how is it getting to people, like connecting it to users is a big chunk of it. Is it get connecting to users adequately? I would probably just say no off the top of my head. It's probably not yet. How can that be optimized then? Okay, great. Maybe that's the next step. I don't know. I don't, I'm not going to recommend make that recommendation, but certainly optimizing use and getting into the hands of it decision maker, decision making types of groups across this landscape. And then perhaps and it, that could be the next thing in and of itself. And then looking at those decision contexts and asking important questions about what they actually need and whether this is providing it. And of course, there's the entire new constellation, really, I mean, it's been evolving, of the partners, the networked partners who are using this resource as one of many resources 
that are trusted and foundational and, and rather comprehensive in their work in those regional, topical, uh, time responsive contexts. And so that all is part of thinking about what you prioritize for assessment. Garouge? Yeah, first of all, thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, my question is just a follow up. So I think you said in the beginning of your presentation that the response rate was pretty low for the main sort of survey that I'm guessing you used to build your uh, or uh, cultivate your findings. I was wondering, and then you also said that uh, representativeness was not an issue. So even though the response rate was low, uh, the data was representative. Could you just elaborate on that? Like, what do you mean by representative? Like, do you mean geographically? Do you mean under engaged communities? Right. Yeah. No. So there were two surveys. And the developer survey had a, a a good response rate. I don't remember it off the top of my head, but it was it was adequate. Um, <clears throat> plus, we had the qualitative for the developers. It was really the user survey where we got low response rate. Um, oh. so the the rep, the the analysis of representation was done um, on uh, on both, I believe, but the on the development side. So across the 350 um, developers, we looked to see there you know, that was cross-sectional across geographies, topical areas, federal versus not federal, et cetera. And that's where we got um, adequate representation. I believe we did look at representation of the user survey and it did, yeah, we did. I know we did because I know we had a chart on that. It did capture the range of stakeholder groups that were, um, I think, bucketed in, um, like, essentially there's NCA Net, which was this stakeholder community um, that GCRP had fostered. And there were um, different types of stakeholders within that. We looked and did a kind of crosswalk, I believe, between that community and who answered the user survey. And we did get representation across those but not necessarily given the low rate, that throws that all into question around who was actually using it. So, so yes and no is the answer. <laughs> okay, and then just another, uh, not a follow-up, but a separate question. Uh, you also said that since the NCA3, there's like more emphasis on learning and evidence. So I was wondering if you could also elaborate on how you're conceptualizing this evidence and if you have any recommendations for the committee when we're thinking about what uh, usability evidence looks like. Yeah, so, um, okay, so two, two parts and maybe in this, maybe a simple way, oh, perhaps overly simplistic, but way to think about it is thinking about the value that comes out of formative assessment versus summative. So formative, <clears throat> If, if you build an evaluation framework and evaluation approach that essentially walks side by side with the process and is embedded essentially in what it is evaluating, then you have learning that is iterative and that comes out of that process. And that's formative. And it can be used at, in time, timely ways for improvement and also just takeaways and learning, like maybe those lessons learned can't be rolled back into improvement, but are noted for next time. So that's formative learning. The evidence piece of that really um, can be thought of, I mean, can be thought of on both sides, but let's just take summatively. It, it needs to be considered when thinking about the overarching framework, getting from here to your goals, and thinking about what your indicators of success towards achieving those goals look like. That is an entire process that I would argue that the NCA enterprise still needs to set up. It's really important because without it, you can't really prioritize what you're investing in for assessment. And so evidence then is about what you're focused on collecting and measuring for understanding and impact. And in the, if you think about it from the more techno 
bureaucratic, if you will, knowledge management, data management space. It's ultimately about information systems and what you can't collect everything. What are you going to collect and track over time? What's important to track over time and, and, and what's not? And there will be cross-cutting indicators that matter, but figuring out what those are is a process. Heather, uh, I, I wanted to uh, turn in a slightly different direction uh, to focus on this use question, because a lot of the language about use uh, assumes that use is a kind of um, uh, a particular uh, delivery of information to a particular decision maker. Uh, and the NCA uh, is, as you mentioned before, the USGCRP is a coordinating body. Uh, and so one of the primary audiences, uh, arguably the primary set of audiences, are the agencies that um, that make up the UC, US, uh, represented on the USGCRP. And they do things with the NCA report and the information that the, and its associated products in their own spheres. Uh, so the Army Corps of Engineers might take uh, the work on water resources and uh, combine that with uh, other aspects of the report of science in the NCA and reformulate that for different constituencies within the Army Corps. And in that sense, use becomes a process, not an action. Uh, and, and I wondered to what extent your evaluation focused on that, um, because mm -hmm. that it, the, there's the, the prime, you know, the, you can imagine that working for the agencies in the sense that, that you can retrieve some data. A much more complicated and open-ended question is what do stakeholders who are not in the federal family, uh, what do they do? How do they react to the NCA, which is also a process, but uh, much more diffuse, hard to get, you know, and a hard to grasp one. I just wondered whether in thinking about use as a process uh, in influenced what you were finding. Yeah, we left it really open. So we certainly did not narrow it down to just decision making. Um, <clears throat> and uh, so in a sense, it is an input. It can be considered an input into other processes, like you said. Um, so it was used across sectors. Um, and and the, the, the results that we did get were about, um, I mean, I have some of some notes here jotted down, but essentially learning and awareness building around issues in places and around topics. Um, certainly informing different types of planning, governmental planning. Um, there is an entire sphere of in which is being used in education for curriculum development, uh, both formally and informally. Um, of course, it's used by researchers, uh, science researchers, federal, external, social scientists, um, draw from it because so much of, 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 of the application of it informs human behaviors. <laughs> so there's all kinds of social science, uh, that is connected to this. Um, so I, yeah, I mean, we kept that really broad and that was baked into the, to the data collections we did both qualitatively and through the surveys. Good. Okay. I'm got my eye on the clock. Any further questions, uh, Scott? I was just going to ask real quick, you you briefly mentioned the emergence of AI systems and how they might affect some of the flexibility or the ability to be responsive in the NCA moving forward. So especially in terms of thinking about this as essentially something that could be a formative process that is built into how the NCA works long term. Um, it seemed like you had more to think and say about AI systems and what they could potentially bring to the table but maybe there's not enough time, we'll see. I would just make a brief comment, which is, um, so I'm a active member of the American Evaluation Association. Um, and there are many evaluators in this space that are touching upon climate issues and there's it's an active community. Um, within that, we examine all kinds of questions around evaluation and assessment. Um, something that, you know, is absolutely uh, being acted upon with the with the birth of chat gtp and uh or chat gpt <laughs> um <clears throat> are these questions around what it does for our jobs and our work um just like it is happening in 
many other spheres, uh, education, et cetera. So we are definitely playing with it. I haven't played with it a whole lot, but I was just asked by a client to play with that, to think about like what it does to qualitative data. Uh, my initial assessment is it, it has a long way to go. Um, a human component is really important, but for, for crunching through a lot of data, if the inputs are right, just like anything, like high quality data input may lead to something that could be usable. And that's being looked at in the evaluation community. Heather, thank you very much for uh, coming this morning and uh, sharing your uh, thoughts, both about what your evaluation did and uh, I think shedding some very useful light on where we are going forward. Uh, so thanks a lot for coming. Uh, I wanted to uh, turn, given that, that we have limited time, uh, to our guests from the USGCRP, uh, including some of the representatives from the supporting agencies. Um, Thank you so much. Allison, let me put you, uh, hand, the, hand the baton over to you since you've got a group of people to introduce to us, but welcome. Thank you. Um, I'm very happy to be here. And that was really interesting. So thank you, Heather. Um, um, Lindsay, are you able to? OK, perfect. OK, excellent. Um, I'm going to give uh, an overview here and then to turn to a panel um, of three experts who have been thinking not just about NCA4 and NCA5, but uh, NCA10 uh, in our sustained assessment working group. I wanted to start off by noting that uh, what I'm presenting in these slides are um, my own perspective, my own opinion. Um, I, I was laughing this morning thinking about coming to the National Academies, uh, doing a present presentation on my opinion and uh, telling you anecdotes with small ends. So, um, but that's that's where we are here. So this does not represent, uh, you know, official federal steering committee findings or anything like that. Uh, next slide, please. Um, right off the bat, uh, I'll note that this is uh, my thinking about the different audiences of the National Climate Assessment, so you can all feel very free to fight me on this. Um, on the left are mandated audiences that come from the GCRA itself, uh, which we you know, deliver the report to Congress and the President, but really in thinking about USGCRP's mission writ large, uh, we are tasked with assisting the nation and the world in understanding global change. Um, in the middle, I kind of think of this bucket as um, decision makers, which helps me separate it a little bit from the bucket to the right, even though those are very blurry boundaries. Um, and I, um, I, I put the people in the middle um, a little bit more as in, in my mind, kind of our, our primary audience that we're working towards. Um, of course, the federal agencies of the USGCRP and beyond. Uh, I think state, local, tribal territories are a huge user of the national climate assessments. And then there's sort of a very large bucket, which I have also uh, called practitioners, for lack of a better word, that I think are um, you know, professionals who might be using NCA data in their work as adaptation specialists or water utility managers or hospital planners. Um, we are seeing a little bit more interest from uh, the private sector and financial sectors. And then I, I have sort of an other category of people making decisions at, at perhaps a household or business level in terms of buying homes or, or making investments. In the third column here, I have important users, and I, I really want to underline the important. Um, just because they're not in the middle bucket does not mean they're they're not important uh, um, users of the report. In fact, we had a really huge number of comments come in for NCA5 from the climate literacy and education community. So they are very actively engaged. They, you know, engaged in making NCA5 more useful to them because they see themselves as a as a major user. Of the report. Um, also, I would put in this category uh, media. Uh, we see the assessments uh, being cited in the media on pretty much a daily basis. Um, and for example, last summer when we had those uh, wildfires in Maui, uh, a lot of the news articles were still citing NCA4, which was, you know, at that point, five years uh, old. Um, so I think hopefully now you're going to see them citing NCA5 more and more often. Uh, next slide, please. 
Um, this is also uh, something I made up, uh, which is a rather imperfect spectrum for how I think people might be using the National Climate Assessment. Um, the, starting on the left side, I would say uh, are people who have heard of the assessment before. And uh, I think that's improving, but I still interact with people fairly regularly who have never heard of the NCA before. I was just giving a presentation where uh, someone came up to me afterwards and said they were incredibly happy, but also very surprised that their tax dollars had been going to this since 1990. Um, so that is that is not uncommon. Uh, I think in the second row, you have people who might be looking for an answer to a specific question, or they're curious, or they want to debate their relatives over Thanksgiving, or they're looking for a quote. Uh, and then in the third bucket, we have uh, justifying an action. And I have to say, if I was guessing, I would say there's a lot of users in that bucket. A lot of people who are quoting NCA to say, this is why climate change is urgent, therefore we should do something about it, but not necessarily further to the right on the spectrum where they're actually um, using the information to understand or prioritize risks. Uh, given everyone's limited staff and budget and resources, uh, what, what um, risks are of greatest concern, uh, whether in my community or in my sector. Uh, beyond that, we have people uh, in the second to last right bucket uh, who may be making cost decision benefits. So looking at the range of scenarios we're presenting in NCA, uh, figuring out, uh, you know, maybe they want to look at a high and medium scenario or two and three degrees of global warming or 2050 versus 2100, and then comparing how those different um, risks might impact them um, under the different scenarios compared to the cost effectiveness of those different scenarios. And then finally, I think all the way on the right is, you know, the folks who are, how high do I build this seawall? How deep do I dig this culvert? Um, how many cooling stations do I place in my community and where do I place them? Um, looking for very specific data to inform their actions. And if I had to guess, I would probably put fewest people in the, the far right bucket. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this is also uh, imperfect, but I tried to map a little bit of where I think um, some of those users might fall. Uh, I would certainly uh, hope that uh, we would have more and more um, users kind of pushed to the right, in, in, in my opinion. Um, I think, um, you know, some of this might even be a little bit wishful thinking for where I place them on there. But, uh, of course, a lot of users can span these different categories as well. Um, we talked about uh, researchers as being one of our uh, user groups who might be looking at the NCA text to figure out where uh, the greatest risks, risks are, and then looking at things like our traceable accounts or uh, our research gaps database to identify what new research to fund uh, or how to develop the research strategy. Next slide, please. I'm gonna go through the next two slides kind of quickly because this is just another way to break down what I had on the previous slide, but more in table format uh, and providing just a few examples of how people in these different categories might be using the assessment. Uh, I wanna point out that the three panelists following me, uh, Aliza, uh, Daryl, and Dan are gonna be speaking a little bit more specifically about three of those user groups. So I won't, I won't linger there too far. Um, Next slide, please. I'm also not going to read this slide um, because there's a lot of text on there. Uh, and these are very specific anecdotes uh, broken out by audience, but I wanted to put it on here so that you would have it um, for your reference. A lot of these anecdotes are still from NCA4. Of course, NCA5 has um, only been around a few months so far. Um, I can tell you for NCA5, uh, we've been doing an ongoing webinar series and have had more than uh, or, or around 7,000 participants already attending those webinars uh, with seven more to go. And more than 6,000 people have watched the recordings of the webinars, which I think is kind of, uh, I, I don't, I'm always amazed when people watch recorded webinars. Uh, <laughs> and then about 3,600 people um, listening to our podcasts. Um, I've briefed congressional staff as well as uh, federal and state judges and, uh, of course, agencies. So I have my trifecta of the three uh, parts of government that I've briefed. 
Uh, and then uh, just a few more examples. We have some economic authors who are going to be speaking at the Federal, Federal Reserve Bank in New York this summer because uh, they really want their staff to understand how the risks of climate change are going to affect the economy as well as some of their activities like um, micro prudential supervision and, and financial uh, stability. And then I mentioned media. Um, NCA5 is still you know, relatively new. We've had um, 2,400 mentions and 7.7 .7 billion impressions online so far, uh, including traditional media. And um, like NCA4, we are seeing NCA5 being cited almost daily in the media. Um, if this is of course free, it's, it's earned media, it's free media, but if it were paid, it would be worth $192 million. Uh, next slide, please. Um, beyond who is using the National Climate Assessment and how they are using it, we don't actually have a good sense of why people might be using it or why they might be using it um, instead of other resources or you know, other types of climate information. A lot of the bold words on this slide have to do with our process and have to do with the principles that drive our process for, for making the assessments robust and authoritative and trustworthy and transparent. Uh, but of course, it could be any or all of these reasons or none of these reasons at all. Next slide, please. Uh, NCA is made up of uh, a lot of different elements, uh, a lot of different chapters, and even within the chapters, different kinds of uh, elements. And I sometimes refer to this as sort of a, an onion type model where um, if you are just looking for very top line takeaway messages, you might be looking only at the overview or only reading the key messages. If you're looking for more specific information about uh, your sector or your region, you might be digging into the chapter text using those figures. Um, then if you if you are a researcher and you're looking to go even further in the, into the technical weeds, uh, you might be looking at our traceable accounts or our metadata or trying to recreate some of the, the data sets uh, or identifying research gaps for your own research. So you can kind of imagine how some of those different user groups might track to um, the different elements of NCA and how they are using them. Next slide, please. Uh, we also have many different uh, products uh, alongside NCA, and some of them are new to NCA5. Um, so we have engagement throughout the development process, including public comment and public calls. You'll hear a little bit more from Eliza on that. We have the website itself, of course. In NCA5, we have the uh, Atlas and the Art Gallery, which is new. We develop a series of downloadable materials, including two or three page handouts, which I've, I'm told teachers really appreciate, um, PowerPoint slides, zip files of all the figures, and for the first time, uh, Spanish translated PDFs. And then we have our communication products, uh, which, um, you know, things like press, uh, social media, webinars, um, and this time podcasts and audiobooks. Um, next slide, and this is my last slide. Um, there is uh, a lot of questions <laughs> on this slide, uh, not a lot of answers in my in entire uh, presentation, of course, um, but the, the last question here is who is not on any of those lists or tables from my previous slide, and who are we not reaching? I think um, we've done a little bit better job in NCA5 of reaching some audiences. Um, namely, uh, I, I think you could almost break these out into process, like um, actions we've taken during the development process, like hosting youth dialogues or holding tribal consultations have reached those audiences. Some of it might be the content of the report. NCA5 has a really strong environmental justice uh, theme throughout the entire report. So that's why we might be reaching those organizers a little bit better. And some of it's the products where we're translating uh, the chapters into Spanish, which I'm hoping will help us reach some more Spanish speaking communities. Um, I've lifted, listed a few of my own ideas about the people in the broader environmental community that we might wanna target for future NCAs. Um, I often feel uh, like we don't even have the full choir yet. Um, so of course, there's also the question of who we should be targeting outside the choir. Uh, and should we be targeting people outside the choir? Uh, and then lastly, I will um, swing back to where I started with, um, even if we aren't expanding our audience, are there ways that we can push the current users a little bit further along that spectrum I made up um, so that we can move people not just from, oh, I've heard of NCA before, um, to a little bit more about 
actually using the NCA in some of their decision-making uh, processes. Um, so I think with that, I am handing it off to Elisa next. Great. Uh, so let me suggest, since you're a panel, that the three of you come up to this table. I will uh, I will change my perch. Uh, Arian, you can stay where you are. But that way, I think it will be easier for the people in the room to to see all three of you at once. Uh, they're all virtual. The, the other Austin. three are virtual. Oh, they're all virtual. Yeah. Okay, well, in that case, there's no point in moving, moving around, is there? So, great. All right. Elisa. Uh, Hello. Elisa Luskin from USGCRP. Thank you for joining us. Oh, great. Thanks for having me. Um, we can go straight to the next slide, please. Great. Okay. So I'm Elisa Lustig. I'm a senior manager on the National Climate Assessment Team, and I also coordinate the USGCRP Sustained Assessment Working Group. Um, and I'm here to provide some perspectives on NCA engagement and to get into some of the specifics of our NCA5 efforts. Next slide, please. Okay, so I'm going to kind of speak to three different areas. First is the who's engaging with the NCA. I'll get into that a little bit more. I'm going to talk um, specifically about the NCA5 processes we used for engagement. Um, I'm going to talk about a um, project that we did a couple of years ago, um, evaluating the NCA use in different state um, and so, well, subnational level uh, climate action plans. And then finally, I'm going to get into some of the lessons learned and ideas that we heard from our sustained assessment working group seminar series, which was done in 2022. All right, next slide. So I thought I'd start by just talking about the engagement opportunities that we had throughout NCA5 and to give you some sense for what we're actually doing to try and reach people. So I'm gonna go through chronologically. First, we um, put out our draft prospectus, which basically outlines the big scope for what the report is going to cover. Um, we did that in uh, summer 2020 and we got 105 comments for NCA5. I, I wish I had the NCA4 numbers and I don't, um, but I do think it's interesting to try and track over time. Um, the types of comments we got on the prospectus were things like, um, you know, add a chapter on X or better coverage of Y geography. So your really big picture um, scope level feedback that we got from, from the public. Um, next, we had our zero order draft public comment. So that was in early 2022, almost, I guess, a year and a half later. Um, and this was the first time we ever did um, such zero order draft public comment for a national climate assessment. Um, we paired that with uh, a workshop series, which I'll get to in a minute. And we had for this um, over 900 comments, just over, um, which was really great. The early stage feedback is critical because we want to make sure that whatever we're doing in the national climate assessment meets the needs of the people who use it. Um, and so that's why, you know, that was at least a big part of the impetus for adding this early stage comment phase. Um, we had tribal consultation, formal tribal consultation, also a first, I believe, for the NCA. That was in late 2022. Um, this was initiated originally by OSTP in an effort to develop guidance for the integration of indigenous knowledge across federal agencies. But we took the opportunity to join them and, um, and had some framing questions and uh, around the information quality guidance we give to authors and ways we could improve that to better represent indigenous knowledge. Um, I think that was very successful because we completely revamped our guidance and uh, that came partway through the process, but um, I think we heard some really positive feedback about it and um, the ways that authors felt more empowered to integrate Indigenous knowledge given that input um, and, and that updated guidance. So that's important for NCA5, but I think it's going to also um, lay a really important foundation for NCA6. Um, fourth, we had what Allison mentioned, the Art by Climate Initiative. This was a first sort of experiment for the National Climate Assessment, wherein we put out a call for art um, across the country in late 2022 into early 23. Um, that was a call for visual art to be included directly in the National Climate Assessment. We did this kind of for two main reasons. The first was to kind of increase the um, community of people who were involved in the national climate assessment process. Um, so obviously bringing in artists and making the report um, perhaps more accessible to folks who wouldn't typically see themselves in a 2000 plus page scientific document. Um, so, so bringing people to the table and then also making the science stick. So making the issue 
um, or not just the science, just the issue itself of climate change more resonant um, and uh, with a broader audience and to help people internalize it in a different way than they might perhaps through text and, and, and numbers and so forth. Um, so that was quite successful. We had 850 plus submissions from across the country. Happy to talk more about it if folks are interested. At the same time, also late 2022, early 2023, we did our classic third order draft public comment. We've done this now for at least two assessments, if not more. Um, we're midstream through the process. We released the draft report. It's of course concurrent with the NASM um, comment phase. Um, we had over 3,000 comments for NCA4, just under for NCA5. And I don't know, you know, why in some years there's more engagement on public comment, in some years there's less. Um, but I do think that is an interesting question um, of why people choose to engage or not. Um, that said, I think, you know, it's fairly robust, all things considered. You know, we had a decent spread across chapters. Certain, certainly some received more comments than others, um, which is kind of an also an interesting question of what draws people in. Um, and yeah, I can think of a number of reasons why certain chapters may receive more coverage than others. Um, and at that stage, unlike kind of back in the zero order draft um, phase, th these comments were much more specific. At this point, we weren't really in the business of adding wholesale new key messages, but we were in the business of finessing those key messages, um, adding case studies, um, and so forth. So it was much more of a targeted review at the midstream phase. And then finally, um, we are currently hosting a webinar series that Allison mentioned. Um, we have at least one for every chapter, and uh, we're also about to get into a set of regional workshops in person. I'll speak more to that in later slides. All right, let's move on, please. Okay, so I'm going to get into some of these in a bit more detail. This is the zero order draft public engagement workshop slide. Um, so like I said, this was early 2022 that we were doing these. Um, we hosted 34 virtual workshops over six weeks, at least one per chapter. Um, we had, for the Caribbean chapter, we had one in Spanish um, and one in English. Oh no, we had one in Spanish, but we had simultaneous translation. For the Southeast, we had two. They did one in the evening, for example, to bring in folks who wouldn't be able to take off time during the workday. Um, but for the most part, we had one per chapter. They were long, so these were between four and four and a half hours. So it's a pretty intense, um, uh, you could call it engagement burden, you could call it a participation opportunity, but this was a more intense option for folks who wanted to engage this way and really get into conversation with authors about the, about the content of the chapter. Um, this ran in parallel with public comment, right, which is a much lesser intensity. So I think that's interesting to think about is the types of engagement we ask of people and how the type of engagement you put out there might enable different folks to participate. Okay, so we, like I said, we had 34 of these. We had over 7,000 registrations by 4,000 individuals from all 50 states plus um, a number of territories. Um, we had ultimately about 2,800 people participate, which is a pretty good rate of, um, a pretty good ratio of registration to participation. Um, the authors facilitated these, so we, they were facilitated by our 450 plus authors in breakout rooms and in plenary, um, with different interactive modes. We, at the same time, received, like I said, over 900 written comments. And I broke down the types of people. It's pretty rare that we actually know who is showing up to participate with us, and that's limited by things like the Paperwork Reduction Act, which limit how we can really um, poll people and survey them. Uh, for example, when they register. But in this case, we uh, made a concerted effort to make that happen. So we had a uh, pretty strong representation from government. I wish we had broken this down a bit more, but government uh, as a whole, about 41%, and you know, also pretty good from academia and nonprofit sector as well. Um, you also see here on the right, percent workshop registration by region. This isn't um, by size of the region, so it's unsurprising perhaps that the Northeast had the most um, with the Southeast together. Um, and then, you know, you get smaller down towards Alaska and the Pacific Islands region and the US Caribbean. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so that was what we were doing at the outset of this project. Now we're here at the end doing these post release webinars. So we have one webinar for every chapter, except for the Caribbean chapter, which did two, one in Spanish, one in English. Um, the goal here is to share the report findings to the broadest possible audience. 
Um, so this is really meant for anybody, the general public to academics and decision makers themselves. Um, another goal is to close the engagement loop. Um, and I think that's true of all of the post-engagement efforts that we do. It's, you know, at the outset, we really ask a lot of people in terms of um, providing input at, at the formative stages. And we don't want to just take that input and, and then never be seen or heard from again. We want to show up and show people what we did with their input. Um, so really getting that full cycle in. Um, and of course, it is a cycle. So I, I'm really hoping that we'll be able to also use some of these post-release engagement opportunities to ask people what they want to see from the next one and keep that conversation going. Um, next, um, oh, so within the within the context of the webinars, yes, the authors are providing information on the key messages. They're talking through um, their various figures and, and narrative texts. We have left a lot of time for Q&A, almost 50% of the webinar, which has been wildly successful. People have a lot of questions and we never get to all of them. Um, we've had, as of Monday, 6,584 people attend so far, but actually as of yesterday, we had another nearly 200. So we're on the up and up, um, 28 webinars to date, seven to go. Um, adaptation, overview and water had far and away the most participants. Um, and as Allison said, over 7,000 people have watched the recorded webinars, which is awesome. Um, from this, I've drawn a number of lessons um, already. First of all, that, that Q&A time is really valuable. People want to interact and um, people have questions about the assessment scope, um, following up on you know certain figures and, and things like that. They have questions about why certain things were included or not. Um, so the Q&A is really valuable. The next is that people really want to hear from us. And I don't know if they really want to hear from the NCA specifically or GCRP as a whole, but we seldom do these public um, facing webinars. And I, it really makes me think we ought to think about doing more of them because um, because they've been so, so widely, widely attended. Um, next, we need more Spanish language outreach. As Allison said, we're translating the entire NCA into Spanish for the first time. It's a first, and I think, you know, we had people show up to our Spanish language webinar, but uh, for the Caribbean chapter, but I think we could have more people. Um, and so, I, you know, that's going to be a growing area in the future, I hope. Um, next, author networks matter. Um, perhaps you've heard of GCRP or in general, this concept of network of networks, wherein GCRP is really kind of the convener. Um, of people who have their own networks out across the climate space, um, that GCRP itself is not the sole holder of, of all stakeholder groups. And I think that that really, really um, is brought to bear in how much the author networks are important for this when the authors do um, spread the word about this, about the assessment, about our events, about the opportunities for comment, people show up. And I think it's, it's really quite powerful. Um, Next, as I mentioned before, it can be difficult to know who we're reaching, and that is true within the case of these webinars. I know how many people were there, but I don't know, you know, much about them. I'd love to know, you know, where people are coming from. Did we get anyone from some of the states we don't typically see much representation from? Um, I think that would be really useful. Um, and next, it's been really valuable to leverage the post-release hype to bring people to the table when we release the report. People are very excited. We published our entire webinar schedule up front, and we had people sign up wholesale for webinars from November through the end of March. So um, I think that was that was a very strategic move, and uh, leveraging release time is is can be really important. Okay, next slide, please. Regional public engagement workshops. So um, we are about to launch these. The goal here is to increase the exposure to and uptake of the assessment science and to offer a more substantive opportunity for discussion between authors and participants. Um, these are not, these are in person and they're not intended for, you know, I mean, while the general public is welcome, these are much more targeted to practitioners, to academics, to decision makers, folks who are using the NCA science in their, in their professional work. Um, these are going to be very interactive in nature and context specific, meaning that we're giving authors a lot of um, leeway in designing the work, workshop they feel will um, best meet the need in the region. I'm going to skip over the timing of these. We're about to publish it um, in the NCA newsletter, so uh, stay tuned for that. All right, next slide. Okay, two slides on the Climate Action Plans Project. 
In 2020, we had a fellow look over publicly available climate action plans across the US. She looked at about 330 plans total um, and searched them all for the phrase National Climate Assessment or NCA, finding that 25% of all plans reference the National Climate Assessment. Um, she showed an increase in NCA references over time, noting that none of the plans um, that came out of NCA one or that came out after NCA one referenced the assessment. Um, very few plans referenced it after NCA two. We saw an uptake after three, and then an even bigger uptake in references to um, NCA four. So that um, is an interesting thing to note that we are perhaps um, gaining visibility and and relevance over time. Next slide. So these are the types of references that came up in these action plans. First, um, just as Allison said, the NCA as justifying a call for action. We have a New York City example here. Um, next, um, NCA as a source for definitions. Um, and I hope that we'll see even more of that given the first ever um, National Climate Assessment Glossary that we released. Um, next, as an, uh, the NCA is an important place to contribute, uh, states encouraging their scientists and, and others to participate in the National Climate Assessment. Um, after that, NCA, of course, is a source for scientific information, whether that's basic science, projections, or information about impacts. And then finally, NCA as a guidepost for planning metrics. I love this one. Um, the Tampa Bay region um, is... Uh, developing a regionally consistent sea level rise planning scenario for the coming decades, and they require it to update every four years immediately following the release of the NCA. So those are the kinds of ways that the NCA is being referenced and used and through these climate action plans. I think it's a, this was a kind of nice example of a quantitative project we were able to take on that feels evaluation-esque. Next slide, please. Okay, in these last two slides, I wanna talk about some of the findings from our sustained assessment working group seminar that we held in the year 2022. Um, the working group thinks largely about, was thinking largely about the future of the national climate assessment. And we invited speakers like Richard Moss, Naomi Oreskes, Louis Rivers, um, Catherine Hayhoe, folks who are thinking um, intensely about assessment over time and, and the future of them. And this is some of the feedback that they provided relevant to engagement. First, saying that the supply side model of scientific information does not um, work. We need to include um, stakeholders from the get-go in the problem definition and framing phases. You could say we're sort of doing this through our Zod public comment, for example, but I'm sure there's more we could be doing. Next, get rid of stop and start involvement, which will change our notion of engagement and think of building ongoing relationships where people can chime in at any time. Um, that is interesting because it totally challenges the notion of draft comment, maybe there's a more um, sustained and continuous way we could be collecting feedback over time. Um, next, see assessment as part of the decision-making process and plan accordingly. Actually, if we could go to the next slide, I think these few bullets here get into that a bit more. Um, you have to understand how the assessment is being used in order to make it use to make the assessment itself useful. Um, and so we need to understand decision maker motivations, constraints, resources, cultural context, et cetera. Um, and then also understand how the assessment fits in with the user's decision making process and design accordingly. So I think that these could be um, informative evaluation questions themselves, um, perhaps not looking at specific NCAs, but thinking about it more broadly. Next, USGCRP as a magnetic field bringing together and guiding the assessment community. That gets to the network of network concepts I mentioned earlier. And then finally, perhaps the biggest picture thinking one is the building of a climate extension service that would revolutionize how communities use science and how science hears from communities. Um, as GCRP gets more into the services space, I think this is a really exciting concept. It would really, of course, challenge our assessment, um, current assessment model, but um, I had to include it because I do think it's a very exciting vision for the next, let's say, couple decade or so. I don't know. Um, so with that, I will close out. Hopefully I didn't take too much time and I will pass it over to Daryl. Thank you, Elisa. That was a very thought provoking uh, and wide ranging discussion. Daryl, are you there? I am. Great. You are. Boy, you're in a nice place. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, that's my local lake. 
very much enjoy uh, working from home. And so uh, I miss, I'll miss shaking all your hands, but uh, still happy to be able to participate. So, hi, I'm Daryl Winner. I work for the Environmental Protection Agency. Um, I've served as EPA's Federal Steering Committee representative for both NCA 4 and 5, and I also co-chair the U.S. Global Change Research Program's Sustained Assessment Working Group um, that you just heard about some of our activities from ELISA. Um, like Allison, I have to tell you that my remarks represent my views um, and are not necessarily those of EPA. Next slide. Daryl, could you speak up a little bit? I'm having a little trouble hearing you. Uh, okay, I will speak more loudly. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to share um, a few um, uh, more. I I'm going to add a few things to Allison's and Elisa's remarks. Um, we'll start. I wanted to give you some examples of the use of national climate assessments by federal agencies. Um, coming from EPA, I'm biased both in my knowledge and what I think is important. So my examples are, are highly EPA specific. Um, first, the 2009 um, endangerment finding for greenhouse gases. That serves as the scientific foundation for all of EPA's policies and actions regarding climate change. Um, and it actually references um, the second national climate assessment. Um, in 2016, EPA published a separate endangerment finding for aircraft to move forward on uh, policies regarding greenhouse gas emissions there. And that cited the third national climate assessment. Um, the fourth national climate assessment was cited in the recently released Climate Change Adaptation Implementation Plan um, for our Office of Air and Radiation. Um, all of the major offices in EPA have an Adaptation Implementation Plan, um, and I would guess that most of them um, cite NCA4. And then um, tomorrow, a new round of Adaptation Plans from all the agencies are due, and we expect to find a lot of references to NCA5. Next slide. Um, the uh, National Climate Assessments and other USGCRP uh, assessments that are also very important, like the State of the Carbon Cycle Report and the Climate and Health Assessment, um, definitely inform agency research priorities. Um, folks in USGCRP compiled a really nice research gaps database that looked at six different climate assessments, um, both volumes of NCA4, NCA3, um, the Carbon Cycle Report, Climate Health Assessment, and a few others. Um, and you can actually ask, access that Research Gaps database base online and um, look at their really um, nice work of um, putting keywords and tagging across all these assessments and seeing um, what the research gaps look like. Um, as Elisa mentioned, one of the things we did in NCA5 was to have a, a, a glossary, um, and we think this will really be helpful um, to help uh, lead towards consistent terminology and use of terminology. And then as um, we're seeing new agencies joining USGCRP, which we're really excited about, we're hoping that we'll see use of the National Climate Assessments in their strategic plans. Next slide. Um, so um, as we think about evaluation of NCA5 and using that to inform NCA6, I think about what could we be doing um, either in terms of the format or function of the NCA, the content, and our outreach and engagement to make NCA more useful to people in our many user communities. Um, should it be shorter? Um, it is quite a large report. Um, having the web being the official report makes it um, not quite as apparent the height of the stack of the thousands of pages, but they're still there. Um, so there's, there's always a push to try to contain the ever-expanding uh, amount of pages. Um, at the same time, people want to see us cover um, more areas, more topics, and so that naturally pushes us towards a longer report with more chapters. Um, what tools should we use? What formats work best? Um, questions like website use, user experience, um, our podcasts um, and videos, um, how can we best get our messages out? Um, and then how can we use climate scenarios to communicate um, future climate change? Uh, traditionally, the larger community has used the many um, time-based pathways like the RCPs, um, but we've also seen people explore the use and utility of global warming levels. So what the world might look like at 
you know, 1.5 degrees Celsius, uh, 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 which we're kind of already at, uh, two degrees, three degrees, et cetera, um, provides a different sort of framing and potentially a way to compare um, more readily across those different scenarios. Next slide. So Allison gave me a prompt that as a federal steering committee member, um, what would be most useful in an NCA evaluation that would inform the decisions the steering committee faces. So my, my response to that are in what forms would maximize the utilities of the NCA to the multiple user communities. I struggled a bit as I wrote that sentence, started mainly with singulars, but kept adding plurals. Um, and that really is in a nutshell, uh, highlights a lot of the issues we wrestle with as a federal steering committee. Um, it's not a singular form, it's many forms, it's multiple user communities. We have in the past, and it would not surprise me as we go forward, um, to see conflicting answers um, based on people's different perspectives across the many user communities um, of the National Climate Assessment. Um, are there ways that we can better integrate user communities into the production of NCA6 and beyond? Um, you've heard both Allison and Elisa lightly touch on this as a federal government entity. We do have rules and regulations we have to follow, one of which um, regards the collection of information and limits um, interact surveys without um, difficult permission um, to get uh, to go beyond that, limits um, connections to communities as well that kick us into a different realm of, of, of rules that govern those sorts of relationships. Um, and then what are the key components of the now? And finally, and maybe most difficultly, as we weigh, weigh our resources, mainly people's time, um, how can we prioritize certain user communities over others? We don't usually enter that questions, but at least in the two uh, NCAs I've been involved in, we, we land at that place of we can't do everything for everyone. Um, and so uh, who do we prioritize? I am seeing a message about my connection, so I'm hoping you're still. Next slide, if you're hearing me. And I'm going to hand it off to my SOG co-chair, Dan Berry. Take it away. Thank you very much, Daryl. Great. Uh, can you see and hear me? Yes. We can. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, yep, so I'm, I'm Dan Barry. I work at NOAA in the Climate Program Office and um, served on the Federal Steering Committee for NCA5 uh, with Daryl and, and also co-chair the SOG with Daryl. Um, hard to follow up those three, um, and I guess I'll just say that I co-sign everything they said um, during their presentations, but I'll try to add a few additional little bits of information and perspective um, to, to the fantastic points that have already been made. If you could go to the next slide, that would be great. Thank you. Yep, so um, a few things, uh, first of all, on, on the structure, um, this question of the national versus regional chapter format of the assessment. Um, the Global Change Research Act is very brief, as I think all of us are aware in terms of what it requires of the production of the assessment, in terms of what it's expecting to see in the assessment, and in terms of instructions for carrying it out. And over the years, the assessment has flourished and grown and includes many topics beyond the um, small subset of topics that are included in the language of the act. Um, and also these regional chapters, which are not called out at all in the act, although are you know, a very reasonable interpretation of trying to communicate about um, impacts to the public. And um, so, you know, in, in an evaluation, I think we really fundamentally want to have a sense of the chapters and, and how um, suitable they are for the audiences that, that we're targeting with the report. Um, is there a good balance and breadth of topics covered in the report? Are the chapters responding to contemporary interest? And I think, you know, there have been examples given where we've, we've added chapters and, and also tried to bring different types of expertise into chapters across the report. To really address some of that that need, um, and then in terms of this utility issue for for federal agencies, are are the um, chapters effectively helping the agencies consolidate their knowledge into 
um, into the assessment and represent the work that that we are doing across the federal government. I think that's another question too, as far as performing an evaluation of of um, the utility and performance of the report from the perspective of the agencies. <clears throat> and then this other question as well, I, you know, I think I'm going to hit on this a few times in my comments around exactly what the assessment is in the broader ecosystem of climate services and um, and, and as a tool that's useful for various climate action communities, um, which is the fact that the assessment serves as a really powerful social tool. So Elisa spent some time, you know, detailing the, the massive amount of outreach that's done and, and the thousands of people who are engaged through that um, and the many thousands beyond that who interact with the report directly through the website and other materials. Um, but this is, you know, at some at some level, not just an assessment of literature or impacts. It's a it's a convening tool, and it serves a really important role in that space. And I think evaluating the way in which the chapters, the structure of the report, um, the various elements of construction of the report, like the workshops and outreach activities, um, how those amplify the the social role that the report plays in the broader climate community. I think that's very important. For the regional chapters, um, I think there's an enduring question about granularity in the report, and usually communities that are taking action really want very high resolution or local scale information, and um, in many ways that's beyond the reach of what the report can do as, as a more general assessment of climate impacts and having funding and scale to really operate at a regional um, scale uh, with some state level information. Um, so these issues of granularity and really evaluating is the report still serving communities um, properly at the level of granularity that it's able to provide at its current scale and scope. And um, the regional chapters are an effort to try to get down to that, that sense of scale. So I think that's an important issue to, to think about in, in the evaluation. Um, this next bullet on public interest in economic, social science, and culture heritage, the assessment um, you know, has historically focused on, on primarily physical climate impacts, but increasingly over the last few years has really considered the way in which communities interact with those um, risks and the social context and understanding of climate impacts. And um, it's something in particular, I think, that, you know, Allison, you know, much credit to her and Elisa um, with the Social Science Coordinating Committee at USGCRP really thought about this between NCA 4 and 5. We received a lot of feedback indicating that there was a desire to see more social science engagement and perspective being brought into the individual chapters, um, not just adding an additional chapter that touches on, on prominent social science issues, but really integrating that type of knowledge and, and framing around climate impacts across the report. And I think we were successful um, generally in that respect, but that's something that would be great to have a benchmark in an evaluation process is um, do communities that are interested in the social dimension side of the way that we build resilience or understand the adaptive capacity of social systems, um, how communities uh, perceive and deal with risk, these very important social science concepts um, that are key in their interaction with climate impacts, really bringing that across the report, and did we do that effectively with NCA5? What's the understanding of that um, through uh, trying to understand that through an evaluation process? Um, the next slide, please. So on this slide, <clears throat> I'm going to focus on the concept of climate services more broadly. Um, this is a little parochial to, to NOAA, um, but the federal government at large as a provider of climate services to the public, um, something that I don't think is clearly established and would be really great to try to elicit through the evaluation process is the role that the assessment plays in climate services nationally and what its perception is amongst different users of the report as far as um, whether it itself is considered to be a climate service. I think Elise, um, Allison provided, provided a framework for this um, indicating, you know, across that cascade of different categorical user types that our hope is to move the report's use a bit to the right on that um, framework. And that right side is really, you know, at the, the very um, highest precision end of, of climate services. So understanding the extent to which the report is seen as being a climate service, um, functions as a climate service, 
um, I think is very important. Um, and, you know, I would say from a NOAA perspective that we generally view the report as um, sort of a lowercase o operational output of much of the climate work that we do in the agency. And so um, I think it's reasonable to argue that, that it is uh, a service in some form. But how does it then fit into the broader landscape of services? And evaluation, I think, could really um, elicit that, that perspective for us better and, and create a, um, a sense of the hierarchy of climate services and how the NCA fits into it. Is, is it a cornerstone of the building? Um, is it more essential than that? Is it um, more flexible than that? Um, and then from, from there, we can really think about how to grow our climate service activities around, um, around the assessment um, in terms of the tools, the data and information, the um, on the ground stakeholder engagement activities. Does that grow directly next to the assessment in the federal landscape or at NOAA specifically? Um, or is it something that kind of remains in parallel and the two processes speak to each other? So that's another um, question that I think would be wonderful to sort of ar arrive at some perspective through evaluation. Uh, next slide, please. This is um, my uh, company and list to, to work Daryl presented just a, a selection of different questions um, that, uh, that, that are somewhat random, but, but that I'm thinking about as a steering committee member. Um, first of all, again, going back to the GCRA, Congress is one of the essential recipients of the report, uh, named explicitly um, in the, the GCRA language. Um, and Allison mentioned this already, that she's had some briefings and whatnot with congressional staff. But I think better understanding if the report is serving the needs of the explicitly named um, recipients in the GCRA language is very important. And it's not always easy to get to that. So um, an evaluation process um, um, should look at that. The um, report structure, Daryl touched on this a bit, um, we're, you know, interested in, in the structure, in how the structure might vary over time, whether it needs to evolve. This is the third cycle where we've delivered an assessment that looks somewhat similar in, in feel and structure and appearance um, with some very significant changes in content, of course. Um, but is this structure still serving communities well? I think we should really try to understand and benchmark that over time. And um, this third bullet kind of goes to that point as well, where, you know, right now the report is, is very linear. It's in chapter format. There's discrete topics distributed across chapters. Um, is that serving user needs um, as well as we need it to? Do we need to consider either reshaping the report or bringing in tools such as AI to help individuals query the report and perhaps draw information from across the chapters and make it a little bit less stovepiped in the way that the information is, is provided or presented. Um, this fourth bullet, I think I've touched on already largely, but just understanding generally the role that the report plays in the broader landscape of climate service and trying to understand climate impacts and the information that stakeholder and response communities um, draw from it and other sources. Um, I think the fifth bullet is largely similar to that point as well. Um, the sixth point, you know, we haven't touched much on this, but a really wonderful aspect of NCA5 has been the um, art, um, the climate art that was contributed by young people and professional artists from across the country. It's really an incredible part of the report and, you know, many, um, much recognition to, to Allison and Elisa for really spearheading that. Um, I've heard from many individuals that that art that the artistic aspect of the report really has drawn them in to it um, which is part of the purpose for having included that in the um, report and thanks to elisa for sharing the link definitely go take a look at the art if you haven't already um, i think we should evaluate um, how how that has worked and if it has drawn in other communities how it has altered understanding of the science um, in addition to being a um, entry point for, for folks who maybe are not going to show up to the report for, for the scientific and analytical content that's there. Uh, it would be great to understand that. And, um, and then finally, you know, really also looking at the federal use of the report and the role that the report plays for different um, federal agencies. I think it, there's probably a lot of heterogeneity there for NOAA. Um, there are a number of chapters that can prominently feature NOAA's work in the climate space, the coastal effects chapter, the ocean and marine resources chapter, 
give us opportunities to express our very specific mission space responsibilities at NOAA. Um, the regional chapters as a highly regionalized agency are very important for our experts to have a platform for us to share our regional knowledge. Um, but I think every agency probably has a number of different incentives and interests in the report. And I think that in the evaluation, it would be great to elicit what those incentives are and interests and then how well the different agency stakeholders feel the report is performing to those interests. So hopefully those are some um, useful additional pieces of, of um, content or thoughts and uh, thanks for including me on the panel. Thanks very much, Dan. Uh, thanks for the whole to the whole panel, uh, as well as to Allison uh, for the this overview. I think that I come away with it uh, with a sense of the of NCA five as a much more varied and uh, complex system than than just a report. Uh, what we do with that perception, I'm not yet sure about. So we'll talk about it. Questions we have about. 20, uh, 25 minutes to, 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 to talk with USGCRP people. Please begin, and I will try to monitor the people who are online. But Jessica, to begin. Thank you so much for, for those presentations. And I'm reminded um, Heather encouraged us to think through you know, the utilization and also um, to prioritize. And so in that spirit, I want to go back to the slide that you had, Allison, where you showed all those examples of use cases. And what I'm trying to wrap my head around is what would be most useful to you and your colleagues? Is it going into depth with those examples to be able to understand some of those questions about, well, why did you use it? And how did you come across it? And what would have made it more useful? So really doing almost case studies of a limited number of uses. Is it trying to capture the landscape of here are, you know, all the different one example from each field about all the very, very many different ways this could be used? Or is it trying to do something more quantitative, like the work that your fellow did to try to say, well, we want to give a number to show impact that this is the number of times it was doing there. So if we can't do all three, where do you fall in terms of, you know, what would be useful to you in depth? totally wide or something kind of quantitative to um, have that punch in terms of the impact. I want to see if Dan and Daryl have a reaction to that first. My first reaction is to appreciate that you're feeling our pain um, and just trying to evaluate this, um, you know, that we struggle with many of these things, issues in, in planning and producing national climate assessment. My personal off the cuff take would be um, an in-depth evaluation on oh, maybe five to less than 10 sort of, of important use cases would be of most interest to us in thinking about how we structure form and function of future reports for those important use cases. But I'm curious to hear Allison's perspective if um, sort of a broader sweep of everything how that might compare in uh, priority. Sure, I'll go and then we'll see if Dan has an answer. Uh, I was actually gonna say the same thing, Daryl, so we're, we're aligned. Um, I think the in-depth, the in-depth one appeals to me most because I think if we could get some of the, some of the people that I was talking about who are kind of in the choir using it more, we can get at that, uh, notion that Eliza was talking about of being the network of networks. So I don't know that USGCRP directly is going to go out and find a lot more, you know, completely new users. But if if we're doing a better job of reaching um, the people who are doing that, um, I think that would that would probably be the best bang for our buck on this. So um, yeah, I'm going to vote for the in depth. Dan, any thoughts? Not going to add much. I, I would also vote for the in-depth, though. I agree with your summation of it. Matt. Hi. So uh, the previous comment was from a representative from Planetary Health Alliance. I'm in a division of climate medicine. You've worked really closely with the American Geophysical Union's GeoHealth section. And as you all know, there's a really strong interest now in bringing together varied communities of practice on the public health side and on the geosciences side. 
And to my mind, one of the great services of these climate assessments is pointing out what kinds of expertise should belong in a transdisciplinary conversation. And I'm wondering if we did focus on more of a narrow case studies thing, like you had pointed out nurses as one group, how a nurse uses this information might be very different than how an epidemiologist does, but they're both within this planetary health space. So it's just a suggestion to maybe not throw the baby out with the bathwater and also mention the wider range of use cases before getting into the nitty gritty of specific examples. Kathy. Yes, so following on this idea of trying to identify a more limited number of user groups and do the deeper dive, I guess my question is, how to identify which groups to do the deeper dive on. And um, when I, I really found it very interesting, your, you know, your schematic there where you showed the different you know, types of engagement that people had. And I think you said, you're trying to get people to move more toward the right. On the other hand, you also said that the very far right was a very small part of the population. So the question is, do you say, oh, that's a small part of the population, so we won't worry about that. Or do you say, that's where we want to get people to. So how? So we want to include that group. I'm I'm just trying to think about how one would make the decisions about what groups to prioritize. If you have any thoughts on that, yeah, my thought is kind of a triage sort of situation. Um, I think the federal agencies. So so first, I'll say, in my opinion, I would be aiming at that middle box of the decision makers. And, and within that middle box of the decision makers, I think we're doing a great job already of the federal agencies. Um, so um, uh, maybe not focusing on them. Um, I think um, where I'd love to see, I, I'm not impressed by the 25% number of state climate action plans who are citing the assessment. I would love to see um, it used much more at a state and local level. And especially as we're thinking about how to evolve these assessments with the regional chapters, without the regional chapters, with different forms of regional chapters, having um, more awareness at the state and local level uh, of the National Climate Assessment as a really helpful resource, um, it is like the sweet spot for me. Uh, and then I think within that broader bucket of decision makers, and, and speaking to Matthew's point too, I think we might have to pick and choose. I mean, there's it's such a broad range. There's you know, engineers and, and nurses and completely different communities. And then, as you said, a lot of diversity within those communities. So I'd probably be picking a few of, of those specific ones. And then I would say, um, you know, on the other side of the triage, um, things like um, individual households or um, general public, or, you know, I, I maybe wouldn't quite in there yet. I don't know that the National Climate Assessment has to be a a household name just yet. Um, so maybe that's how I would triage the, the kind of the middle ground. Um, I would add, can I add to what Allison said? Is there time? Yeah, please do. Okay. Um, so thinking about that hierarchy, the framework that, that you mentioned, Kathy, um, that Allison presented, um, the assessment as, as this linear thing that has a bunch of chapters and is presented in that format and is operating at a regionalized scale at, at its finest is going to struggle to inform actions. Um, Noah's working with a wide array of communities like, you know, Allison calls out in her quote, my building specifications are blah, 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 blah. The engineers want analyze data sets that are very specific and have specific analytical context around them and thresholds and things like that. Um, and they want to co-develop that. They don't just want to receive it. Um, so I think something like the assessment in its current state is going to be difficult to ever get all the way to the, the right. But it goes back to this question that I'm wondering about, about how the assessment figures in the larger landscape about of federal climate service information. And one of the interesting things um, is and and i've been managing this at NOAA. Uh, NOAA provides the funding for the technical support unit that um, does a lot of the work on the assessment editorial work scientific work developing data sets for authors and then the production of the report and that team has 20 people ish who are involved with 
they're good writers. They're good, you know, they know a lot about the science. They are excellent with data analysis and web tool development. So there's a wide array of skills on that team. And for me, as a manager who has been trying to um, build initiatives around climate data services, projection services for stakeholders like engineering communities or reinsurance, the assessment team has actually been sort of a central kernel of how we're trying to build this at a larger scale. And so it's kind of interesting to me to see that when I look around NOAA at where you know, the, the climate service activities can, can really flourish, it's actually right in the team that produces the assessment. And I think that speaks to the, to, the, to the model in my mind that the assessment is really the central thing that a lot of other activities can be built off of in both a practical um, manner, but also in terms of like a broader considerations manner in terms of the, the kind of social mechanism of the assessment more broadly. Um, so I don't know, you know exactly what the NCA itself, the full extent of how far it can get to the right on, on Allison's framework, but um, I think it's worth considering that um, that it is it is a very useful platform on which to to build additional services and and to extend beyond you know this really important convening role and in, informational foundational information setting role that the assessment already plays so well. Heather, you had I want to chime in. Sure, yeah. Um, a thought that comes to my mind is similar, certainly along these lines, but thinking about um, the compelling stories that connect this. The, the NCA information, not only to just decisions of all types, but to actual on the ground change. Let's just take adaptation and all the different kinds of decisions that connect to that. If we bucket that very general concept into two main areas of things that we can always iterate on and improve upon versus those that are foundational that we make decisions on and it might we might need to live with it for another 30 to 50 years infrastructure for instance or moving communities um, things that are more durable that we actually are already having to decide on now and i would include education in that we are educating the next generation of people who are going to help us move this to a better place ideally and so um in some senses that's a durable uh, tangible thing happening. I think those kinds of, I mean, depending on who the audience is, but say it's Congress, and of course these stories sometimes are used to compel funding, of course, among other reasons, but um, connecting it to on the ground is actually not, I would argue, not too far to go. It seems kind of uh, overwhelming at times to think about connecting it all the way there, but I do think there are stories there from what you all have laid out about who's using it for what, and maybe one avenue is to think, um, would that be, would that rise to the level now of saying, this is already compelling, important decisions that are going to endure in our landscape in our, and in society for the next few decades. Rouge? Yeah, um, I just had a quick question. I haven't had a chance to look at some of those outfacing products on some of the websites, but I was wondering if your team had talked about opportunities for customization or personalization. Now, I know that there was a graphic where there were those regional workshops, but are there any tools like, for example, you know, someone can put in their zip code and it'll spit out uh, some information because I know a lot of community groups, they just want information and they're happy to sort of, um, you know, analyze that information, but it's great to have that unit of level analysis information. So I'm just wondering if, and I know, I'm probably guessing there's a lot of resources and money involved in doing this, but I'm just wondering, have you had those conversations and what those conversations look like? I'll, I'll note that we have the um, NCA Atlas, which is atlas.globalchange.gov, and that is using the NCA5 data um, but in an interactive mapping tool, kind of speaking to the services piece that Dan was talking about, and that lets you choose the variables of interest, choose the global warming level of interest, and then zoom really far into your uh, state or county to create a map. Um, you could overlay the Justice 40, you know, layers over it. Um, so, so really customizable maps for those purposes. 
so if the exact figure you need is not one of the 400 figures in the report, you can create it. I would say that's the major one that we have now, but a conversation that we have a lot um, across USGCRP is developing derivative products. So we spend all these years, all this time, all this money creating this giant resource of wealth, wealth of information, um, 2,000 pages of it. But if you could um, distill that into a six page brochure for a coastal fisheries manager in the Northeast, that would be, you know, that information is probably in there. Um, and if you could tailor it in, in that sort of bespoke way, it would be very effective for that audience. I don't know that we have ever really successfully created uh, derivative products like that. And I think we'd have to be really thoughtful about um, you know, who we're prioritizing in those uh, audiences. And we would probably need more help um, from agencies to, to sort of champion those projects. Scott. So I know I brought this up before in our committee meetings, but it's great to have this audience here to talk about it with. Um, so in the spirit of being a network of networks, um, Eliza mentioned uh, sort of a national climate extension services network. And obviously the federal government has already spent a lot of money creating networks like the CAS system and the CAP Reese's and things like that um, in the USDA climate hubs. I'm just curious, thinking across different government agencies, is this something that you're thinking about and engaging those other existing climate services organizations throughout the country and you know what what are your what is your thinking about that and any conversations that you've had um i'll say briefly that um so usgcrp is you know just beginning to think more about what it would look like to expand into a services space and um Involved in that are all of the organizations you just mentioned, and then some. We, it's like everywhere you look, you realize that agencies have regional entities doing um, work outside of just a headquarters, right? Like you, you mentioned those three, and those are the three we start with. But we have the BIA tribal liaisons, we have the EPA regional offices, we have the DOE has all of these regional entities. And we have the uh, regional climate service directors from NOAA, the RCCs, regional climate centers from NOAA. It's like the list goes on and on. There's so many people doing regional work already. And we have, through the National Climate Assessment, like Dan said, it's a convening force, right? So we've brought folks together around the NCA um, to try and think about ways that we can best model the report to meet the needs that they know their stakeholders have, and then um, include them in our process as well. Um, so we've done some of that, but I do think there's a lot more we could do in thinking about how to coordinate efforts um, and also very much respect that they each have their own missions and goals and um, governance models, funding structures, et cetera. So it's complicated to do the coordination work, but I think especially as we think more about the assessment to services, grayscale, if you will, um, figuring out how to yeah, do the coordination that's going to become more and more relevant. Carlos, and then I want to uh, wrap up with a question from somebody we haven't heard from yet, but, but go ahead, Carlos. Thank you. Uh, I have a quick question for, for Alison, because I see that the universe of users of the NCA is so big and so complex that what is the main objective of the assessment for you? That's a tough question and kind of a personal one too. I, I um, what I want the assessment to do is move the needle on change in the U.S. in terms of mitigation and adaptation. Um, so getting to what um, Heather was talking about of, of sort of those causal outcomes, um, I don't I don't want people I don't want to do the assessment just so people have heard of the assessment. Um, I I want it to actually inform those decisions in a way that makes it easier to do those decisions and that we learn from them and that communities see what worked and what didn't work and then build and build and build. I want the assessment to be a, a snowball that, that gets us to our targets, our emissions targets and you know climate ready targets. Okay, now uh, we're running out of time and Mike Cooperberg's been uh, 
participating on online, but I, we haven't heard from him yet. Now, a lot of good things have been said uh, and compliments have been offered to Allison, uh, and I'm sure and she is certainly deserving of them, uh, path-breaking things like the uh, Art by Climate uh, Initiative and so on. Allison's going back to her agency. <laughs> uh, Mike, uh, who's been directing the USGCRP uh, for three cycles now, is it Mike? Uh, four cycles, you, you are, you're gonna be, you're still gonna be here. So we wanna, we wanna hear from you before we break up. Uh, your thoughts about, uh, we've, we've spent a lot of time recently talking about uh, the evolution or emergence of a national climate service uh, ecosystem. Uh, I guess the question I put to you is, do you see the USGCRP as an arena in which questions about what is feasible to do uh, in climate services uh, and, and how to build a coalition uh, within the federal government, including Congress for uh, climate services, is USGCRP the focal point of that uh, kind of conversation and should it be? So, Kai, thanks for, the, for a moment. I'll, I'll try to be very brief. Um, the answer is yes. That, that's the very brief answer. Yes, USGCRP is the venue for the coordination of climate services across the federal government. Uh, the Committee on Environment chartered a new subcommittee. That new subcommittee will have its first meeting late in March. Um, there's a lot of groundwork being done right now. The new subcommittee is called the Subcommittee on Climate Services. A lot of groundwork's going on right now on who will sit on the subcommittee, what its responsibilities will be, how it will relate to the Subcommittee on Global Change Research, how it will relate to the larger, where it will sit within the larger U.S. Global Change Research Program. So lots of lots of work being um, done right now that we'll be able to talk about once it's all nailed down. We'll have have all the details, but absolutely, uh, there's a need for the coordination of climate services. I think it's generally agreed. There was a, a fast track action committee that put out a report that that endorsed that, and that uh, that report also endorsed the fact that USGCRP should be the the home, the venue for the coordination of climate services. So we're very excited about that. And, and we see the National Climate Assessment as a climate service. I mean, it, it certainly is the sort of thing one would do uh, were one to have a, a, a large, coordinated, integrated climate services across the across the country, across the government. Great, thank you. Because uh, where this relates to what we are doing in this committee is that the evaluation of uh, look, looking backward toward uh, NCA 5, uh, in some ways, uh, can we hope might clarify uh, the discussion about where you're going, not only with NCA six, but with this discussion about climate services. Uh, and the, what's been floating in my mind, in the as I've listened to this fascinating discussion, uh, is the question of bandwidth. Um, if you look back uh, at how macroeconomic policy took shape in the United States. In 1946, uh, the the um, uh, Congress passed uh, what created and created the Council of Economic Advisors in the White House, and they issue an annual report, the economic report to the president uh, every year. And this is a compilation of the economic statistics, uh, labor, uh, industry, um, and then they have a, a group, uh, you know, special chapters in each report that focus on particular topics. And that's a that's a volume that is a reference volume in terms of the uh, data that it presents. Uh, and it's a it's a it's a discussion uh, sending it, you know, uh, uh, process, but it reaches directly a very narrow audience. It's a very important audience, members of the Federal Reserve. <laughs> Uh, and Congress, uh, congressional uh, uh, committees, and so on, but their bandwidth is very s closely circumscribed, and in a way, you could read the GCRA that way. You could say, okay, what we're what we're trying to do is to create an annual report or a quadrennial report on the state of the climate, uh, and then hand that off to decision makers across the government. Another way of thinking about bandwidth is the way that Dan was talking about, and Noah, 
uh, and the emergence really over a, a long period of time in a set of uh, independent decisions of the creation of weather forecasting and the Weather Channel and the AccuWeather. And you know, there are a lot of private sector actors in this. Um, and the way in which people now uh, think about their relationship to weather conditions, I think in a very different way than than uh, 30 or 40 years ago. Sure. I mean, this morning, I was trying to figure out when to walk here to avoid the rainstorm. And, and, I, had, and I had at my disposal uh, a radar map, uh, and, and a radar map with a projection of rainfall so that I could try to choose the, the optimal time to walk from the hotel over to this building. Now that's a kind of use, okay, so the, of, of, I mean, talk about a granular use, right? There's, that's a granular use of weather data uh, that was just simply, certainly out of my grasp, uh, not very long ago, but now is routine, you know. So, so what I'm getting at here is that the Weather Service and NOAA provide weather information across a very broad spectrum, and they have to think in, in terms of a very sophisticated system of uh, developing collateral products in partnership with the private sector and so on. And, and that's a very different vision of what a national climate information production system would look like. And, oh. and, and that's, you know, those are, and, and where you, where the country will land uh, with climate information, I think is, is, is what Mike just said is, GCRP is going to be the arena where some of those questions are surfaced over the next several years. Is that correct, Mike? Ab absolutely. I just want to be crystal clear USGCRP is not going to be producing climate services. National Climate Assessment as a special case. The USGCRP, the intention is we're event a, a nexus for the coordination of, of developing and providing climate services across the government and probably beyond the government too. Right. And the Council of Economic Advisors, you know, which produces the economic report to the president, partially does that job, but there are other major sources of economic information like the Bureau of Labor Statistics uh, and the Commerce Department. So, so it, it's unclear to me where, you know, even what the strategic alternatives are, but this is a fascinating discussion, I guess is what I'd say. And welcome our two guests. Uh, uh, Juan Declared Barreto from the University of Concern, Concern, uh, the Union of Concerned Scientists, and Anne Marie Chichili from Northern Arizona University and the Institute for Tribal Environmental Protect Professionals. Thank you both for um, talking with us this afternoon. Uh, Juan and then Anne Marie will both address questions of historically underrepresented groups and their potential uh, participation, actual and potential participation <clears throat> excuse me, in the processes of the national climate assessment. Um, as you both know, um, underrepresented groups um, <clears throat> have, been, uh, have been a high priority for the national climate assessment and, and particularly the national fifth assessment, which was just released <clears throat> a few months ago. Um, but this remains a, 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 a really difficult area uh, of engagement, uh, because, partly because the National Climate Assessment contains uh, and is built on a foundation of uh, physical science uh, that is uh, not accessible to uh, a lot of people, including people in underrepresented groups. Juan, would you start? And we'll hear from you for that. 15 minutes and then Anne-Marie, and then we'll have some questions and answers. Hi, thank you. Um, you please put up my slides, thank you. Um, hi, thank you for inviting me. Thank you for you um, and Nason for inviting me. My name is Juan Declet Barreto. I'm a bilingual senior social scientist um, with the Climate and Energy Program. A, a bilingual senior social scientist for climate vulnerability in the Climate and Energy Program at the Union of Concerned Scientists. Um, uh, UCS is a scientific uh, national advocacy group um, focused on um, addressing the climate crisis in an equitable ways um, and 
all other sorts of environmental um, uh, issues that, that multiple communities face. Um, I'm happy to be here uh, today. I think UCS um, provides uh, or, or, or um, a, 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 a link between the science that comes from the National Climate Assessment and other um, um, uh, scientific um, reports or and data on um, on the climate crisis and how that can be communicated and put to use in actual ways, especially for and by um, vulnerable communities. Um, I'll talk a little bit about how we use a national climate assessment. Um, I'll talk a little bit about what sort of climate data sources we use, um, what sort of frequent requests we get um, in the course of doing our work, um, and so on. Can you, uh, next slide, please. All right, so how do we use uh, the National Climate Asse Assessment? We use it in various ways. We uh, get very excited when it's going to be released. Um, um, we, pour, we pour over it. I believe that we receive embargoed versions. Um, and um, we use it to communicate um, our uh, the, the state of the climate to the general uh, uh, public, to policymakers, to impacted communities. We do a lot of this work in English and Spanish, even though you don't, uh, there, there's no such examples here. Um, we inform the general public and message around the need for urgent action on climate. Um, we use it to combat disinformation and misinformation from climate change uh, deniers as part of also of our accountability um, uh, campaign to hold fossil fuel uh, companies and other climate deniers and enables, enablers of the climate crisis accountable for their, for their actions and um, their role in the climate crisis. And we use it also to provide context on equitable impacts and the need for policymakers to equitably address the climate crisis. Um, we integrate it also into some of our work on the on your uh, bottom left uh, side there. Um, uh, that's our our uh, killer heat work from 2019, where we looked at the frequency of the heat of, uh, of the heat index, our different thresholds under uh, a number of climate scenarios. We aggregated our results to the uh, to the National Climate Assessment. I think NCA four. Um, regions. Um, so we see ourselves, I, I, I've been thinking of ourselves as sort of a power user for the National Climate Assessment. Um, from the more general sort of like explainer pages, such as uh, those sort of evergreen um, uh, uh, pages that we that we post, um, to uh, deep dives on the data, on the specific chapters, um, on what it means for, um, for the state of climate and the different sectors that the NCA covers. And we also use it to drive our social media engagement as well. Next slide, please. Some of the sources that we rely on for climate information and data are obviously the National Climate Assessment, the IPCC assessment uh, reports, um, but also we pay attention to, for example, NOAA's uh, hurricane season outlook um, um, when we start seeing those yellow dots on, on, on the National Hurricane uh, Center tracking website, we start, you know, forming off the coast of Africa makes us a little bit anxious, and um, we pay attention uh, to these, uh, to, to these uh, seasonal outlooks also for, for drought for, for much of our work. Um, we pay attention to the uh, weather.gov, where the National Weather Service alerts are, um, are communicated to the public. We use that also to drive on the bottom right-hand side. Um, we use uh, to drive our messaging on what we call uh, danger season, which is the period between May and October where climate change is making um, extreme weather more dangerous. We use, uh, we use the National Weather Service data to track heat, um, uh, fire weather alerts, as well as floods and storm alerts. During, during that period um, on a public facing uh, websites that keep day track uh, uh, daily of, of, of these alerts and help us drive our messaging along, not just climate, but what it means for, for example, the energy grid. Um, we also use um, uh, downscale um, uh, models uh, from uh, general circulation models to, to incorporate into our, into our research. And um, and also the state um, level summaries from the National Climate Assessment are very useful for our work when we wish to contextualize uh, regional or state um, climate conditions for blogs and other messaging or research that we're conducting. And we like these sources because these are credible sources that are straightforward to communicate to the public um, about the need for climate action and using the best um, and latest of uh, uh, science. Next slide, please. Some of the key gaps that we see are some are related to national climate assessment. Some not, some are broader sort of concerns about. Um, I, I I think um, Dan um, earlier from you um, from um, USGCR on the, the USGCRP um, um, section I mentioned that communities ask for a lot for local very often ask for localized 
um, impacts data and that that is a little bit beyond what the National Climate Assessment can do. And we certainly understand that there are some limitations, right, on um, the spatial scale, the spatial resolution of the climate data that are made available uh, um, to the public. Um, and uh, we, we see that that's an area that, uh, which uh, could be improved um, by collaboration between uh, the, the folks who develop the National Climate Assessment, the research that go, the researchers that produce the research that goes into that, and also scientific nonprofits such as our unit of concerned scientists. Um, we also see, and these are also other sort of common issues, you know, the dynamics of cascading impacts across different sectors um, and how the impact communities are hard to quantify when you look at how climate impacts not just housing, but the availability of um, of access to, to, for example, healthcare services, uh, housing, jobs, transportation, and so on. At a small scale, those are difficult to quantify. Um, we also see that, that the impacts of inequitable policies are hard to assess, and, and, and I'm pointing to, a, to an exception that obviously it's not, again, not exactly re, uh, related to the NCA, but a, um, a, a study um, that has uh, received a lot of coverage in terms of how the historical basis policy redlining has an impact on both, uh, this, this study is on um, surface temperatures, um, showing that the uh, neighborhoods that were redlined that were in the, in the, in the, uh, in the more has hazardous um, um, categories, which is um, code for having more people of color living in them are consistently hotter than other neighborhoods. And there's a similar study that has done the same thing with particular matter and other, in uh, and, and similar air pollutants. And, and, I, and I put this here as an example because this is a very clear example, a very unique example of a, um, a policy that was very ill-formed, very racist, and that happened a long time ago, but still has very measurable and clear impacts. And that is um, not so, this is very unique. You know, this is not very easy to find, um, to be able to quantify the, the long lasting impact on the spatial, that, that spatially imprinted on the na on neighborhoods um, of, of uh, such a policy. And this is the kind of thing that I, as a researcher, would like to see, to be able to see more of, to, to be able to track over time or to quantify with a high degree of spatial and temporal resolution, what are the specific impacts that a, a, a policy, um, in this case, a sort of um, de jure policy, or, I'm sorry, a, a de facto policy to so to speak, because that policy itself was not, it, it, it wasn't codified as law, it was codified as a practice of, of um, the real estate industry and the real estate banking industry uh, as well, but it still had a pernicious impact that's there. Um, next slide, please. Some, old, some common requests that we get related to climate inf information um, we get a lot of questions asked about how to turn the abundance of data that are out there into useful, actionable information for communities and for policymakers. We have um, used some of the data sources that I that I mentioned to um, uh, develop um, our our products to communicate to the public how different communities are being impacted by um, climate augmented extreme weather events such as fire weather or the conditions for 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 wildfires to develop flooding, extreme heat in cities, um, also how extreme heat is impacting um, outdoor workers, um, including construction workers, delivery services, first responders, um, and so on. And also how um, specific people and places or sectors of the economy, such as national park services, parks are being impacted by extreme heat, or workers at airports, for example, um, and many of the and 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 in the central map in Orange, you can see how um, um, the the maps that we have developed showing the frequency of multiple threats that occur simultaneously, where the darkest colors in that map show counties that have had um, more than one more than one type of these extreme types of um, um, alerts, extreme weather alerts that we've talked about, um, extreme heat, floods, um, storms. And, and fire weather. Um, and um, this, this helps us um, um, communicate to the public and in response to, um, to requests that we get sometimes because we do work with um, environmental justice and climate justice communities that ask us for requests or other sort of partners that represent folks in the labor space, um, the farm worker space, um, um, both nationally and specific communities in, in, in specific places in the US and the territories that are facing different um, climate impacts. So um, 
it's a little bit of a whirlwind um, tour through some of the ways in which we use the National Climate Assessment and also other sources of climate data. And I hope that this is the start of a conversation for UCS to, to help shape and frame some of these um, issues and desires that folks that came before me were been asking about and thinking through how to better engage communities, how to strengthen um, the National Climate Assessment, both in pr the process and the final product. And uh, next slide. Oh, I forgot to say one thing. Um, um, there's a, there was a guiding question about what were the voices that are missing from the conversation, and some folks have already alluded to this, but I'll be remiss if I didn't um, uh, if I didn't uh, say that we need to have communities that are uh, typically underrepresented. Um, these pictures are examples of community-based organizations that we, the UCS works with that are creating their own engagements with their own um, um, uh, experts, community experts, both um, not necessarily people with PhDs and master's degrees and advanced degrees, but uh, community experts, folks who know and understand the environmental histories, the climate histories of their communities, the social and demographic needs of their communities and are engaging with other experts, technical experts, policymakers, technocrats, um, and, and, and other experts in, 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 in different areas, such as those represented here, to develop um, uh, solutions, to, to, to assess the state of their own environmental and climate uh, conditions, to then propose solutions that center community needs. And um, I, 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 am, I am happy to see at, at, at the NCA um, integration of those voices, integration of sort of case studies um, and vignettes of communities and impacts, um, but there's always more than can be done to bring these key voices into the conversation. Next slide, please. And I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Juan. Uh, before I <clears throat> turn to uh, Anne Marie, let me ask you whether uh, the Uni Union of Concerned Scientists has the capacity to reach out to still more of the community groups you showed on the last on your last slide. Yeah, I would say so. Um, we see that as part of our existing commitments and ongoing commitments to a um, to, to to developing equitable policies and equitable engagement around the climate crisis. And so, um, yes, that is something that is part of the work that we do, and we would really like to continue to be that sort of interface um, and or or expand our role in that sort of interface to be able um, to clearly communicate with communities and with uh, the efforts around the NCA to improve it. Great, thank you. And Maureen? There you are. Good afternoon, and I will share my screen at this time. Um, I'm going to start. Well, good afternoon. Uh, I am Anne Marie Chischilly, and I am coming to you from Flagstaff, Arizona. Uh, this is a picture of our Native American Cultural Center at Northern Arizona University. And just to acknowledge the land that I'm on, I'm, I'm on land, homeland sacred to 13 tribes in this region, in Flagstaff region, including my own. And I am Diné, enrolled at the Navajo Nation. And I'm currently the Vice President of Native American Initiatives at NAU. And I was also a Southwest chapter author. So um, one thing I wanted to talk about was the, in the National Climate Assessment is the obvious thing that I, I don't know very well, it's obvious to me and the folks that I work with is that number 16, chapter 16 is the only chapter specifically for an ethnic group or a race, um, and that's indigenous peoples. Um, and for um, ever since NCA one, we've been, I think the same uh, type of language has been used, which is indigenous peoples or tribal nation members have been, are disproportionately impacted by climate change um, because of our subsistence lifestyle and because of our socioeconomic um, history. Um, not only our history, but our socioeconomic impacts to that. So I just wanted to really highlight that and highlight um, how important it is that um, since we're in the NCA5, that our voices um, are heard in, a, in from our point of view. 
So what I did was I met with several of the indigenous authors for the NCA5, and I just want to go through some of their statements. Um, when you're considering, and I believe oh, the speaker before me spoke about this, what was the number of indigenous black brown authors compared to previous years and the percentage of those in early career stages? Also, to what degree were these authors from these groups that were first timers in the NCA? I was a first timer this year, and, and to be honest, my experience was very difficult. Um, I'll get into um, just how, how feeling like um, my comments weren't really considered important because it wasn't coming from a scientific background. And so those were some of my feelings um, when I was participating. The second one says the activities occurred internally or what activities occurred internally within NCA to promote and support the success of the people of color authors. Um, you'll get to this in, in, the, in further recommendations is there should be, if there's a first timer and maybe not just for all first timer authors to really have a training session before you jump into NCA5. Because I, if you're not um, comfortable or have the experience of being an author in high level um, documents, a lot of times um, you will get lost. So third, what degree of relevance does NCA have to decision makers from diverse um, this indigenous black brown communities? That is, are the results targeted to be legible to by them or are they results mainly intended to be legible to the generic audience? This is a huge one. I oversee tribal consultation at Northern Arizona University and one of the things I often talk to about with all of the folks who are developing proposals is that the tribal community or the community intended to be served understand completely what is what is the results and what are the benefits to them and what are the um, risks to them. So those are some of the things from some of the authors that I came in. I'll talk a little bit more about more later. My big question, and I always ask this, and I've been asking this since NCA3, if you take the chapters and put them into this grid, you'll see that Indigenous Peoples is chapter 16. One of the questions I want to um, research is what is the federal sustained funding for each of these chapters from the federal government? Because I can tell you right now, the Indigenous Peoples commun um, community has 574 tribes. And um, last summer, we got a big boost from President um, Biden, and we're very thankful, 120 million. But if you divide it by 574, you get down to 200,000. Now, all of us who are working with budgets know what 200,000 can and cannot buy when it comes to climate change mitigation. So my question to the NCA5 is, and this goes back to, is it legible? Is it are people understanding the benefits of participating in NCA5? And that would be one of them would be what, what is the leverage that comes, the financial leverage that comes from being a part of this chapter? And how is it, if we're the most disproportionately impacted, what is the federal sustained funding for um, sovereign nations? That would be my question. If you look at the sustain, if you look at um, the indigenous chapter, or there was an indigenous people's chapter, uh, one of the um, the third key message I just wanted to highlight, and that's indigenous peoples lead numerous actions that respond to climate change. Indigenous led organizations, initiatives, and movements have demonstrated diverse strategies for climate adaptation and mitigation that are guided. And this is the key word, two key words, by indigenous knowledge and values in pursuit of indigenous rights. Now, I don't know how many of you understand what indigenous knowledge is, is, but it's a huge movement right now, not only in Indian country, not only in the United States, but globally. Indigenous knowledge has come on the scene probably in 2014 and has been defined. I happily will refer you to some readings, but um, it's a very big movement right now in understanding the difference between Western science and indigenous knowledges. When I came, when I sat on the first federal advisory committee, which was the advisability committee on climate change and natural resource science, 
under Sally Jewell. This is before they're under, I think, as Obama. Um, one of the things we did was we developed a, what's called the Guidance for Use of Traditional Knowledges in Climate Change Initiatives. And we set that policy in right around 2015. And so federal agencies began to understand that at the time, you can no longer um, reject or exclude grant proposals that are coming from tribes that you want to use traditional knowledges as opposed to our Western science. And it does not have to be validated by Western science in order to be considered um, science. So that's one of the things I wanted to talk about today. This is another um, author. This is one author who um, worked in the human health chapter. She said, I was proud to be a part of the group of people who worked in various fields related to human health. As a Diné woman or Navajo woman, I felt comfortable enough to share about the disproportionate impacts that tribal nations face every day. Most tribes live in rural, underserved areas where people and the environment lack the infrastructure to adequately and quickly address health concerns. My participation in writing of the chapter and the team discussions led me to wonder how seriously my co-authors considered my perspectives and knowledge. Would my fellow co-authors consider or even remember tribal communities and the lack of resources and funding that readily assist um, people in time of need? I would hope that other chapters would follow the actions of the lead author for the human um, health chapter and consider the meaningful participation and inclusion, inclusion of indigenous scholars, experts, and knowledge holders as part of their future chapters. Additionally, there should be some more training or explanation of how graphics are created, especially for new authors. This process was rushed and I did not adequately, I did not feel adequately prepared to participate in this creation. So there are several things to glean from this comment, and that was the inclusion, I think, the community voices. Um, here she says it in her third paragraph, the inclusion of the indigenous scholars, experts, and knowledge holders. So experts and knowledge holders are a unique um, term under indigenous knowledges. They may be considered medicine people, elders, and even youth. Um, so I, I don't see that very much in, in NCA 5. Um, are the elders that come from our communities or the youth voice that comes from our communities? Um, and then also other communities like Two-Spirit or the LGBT community, the disabled community, um, the, and the veterans, so, some of those communities as well. So this is one comment as well I wanted to share. So when you look at Indigenous traditional ecological knowledges, also known as TEK, traditional knowledges, uh, this way, all four terms are put into one award. And in 2021, President Biden um, issued an executive order that basically said that the federal agency is now going to include indigenous knowledges. And it ensured that federal agencies conduct regular, meaningful, and robust consultation with tribal officials in the development of federal research policies and decisions, especially decisions that may affect tribal nations and the people they represent. So since 2021, the federal, we, they went through public comments and then now they're going, they went through their first drafts and um, now all the federal agencies are supposed to have their own guidance and training programs. And last summer, I spent my summer, part of my summer with DOI, developing their guidance and their training manual. And it was guided by um, these six um, indigenous experts in the field. And we, I don't know how well we're published right now, but this is the publication of the procedures of inclusion and application of indigenous knowledges and in activities of the department handbook. And then there's a training manual with it. So I just want to say, as NCA 5, one of the things I really wanted to include was just how we incorporate and talk about Indigenous knowledges and Western science. So this is uh, the Institute for Tribal Environmental Professionals. I write that down because I used to oversee them. I still oversee them in my division, but I'm no longer di director. Um, they put out what's called the Status of Tribes and Climate Change Report. It's by 90 authors who are considered tribal experts. 
And then more important, more, I think not more importantly, but just including 34 tribal narratives. So if you want the perspective of what's happening in tribal nations, there are 34 narratives that you can go to and say, oh, this is their concern. This is their recommendations. And this is how they want to solve issues around climate change. Um, so it's basically to hear the tribal voices first and the solutions. It's been shared with the U.S. We had a hearing on it at the U.S. Senate, and then also the IPCC also quoted from it. And the way this, this particular report came about was in NCA4, and this is another issue that happens a lot. In NCA4, um, that team did not have citable information about Indigenous issues. So they we drafted NCA, um, the stack report, to fill in the gaps of those that um, we could not cite from. So this is a fully um, um, peer-reviewed document. And so NCA 5 now quotes heavily from NCA, um, from this um, stack report. So that's another thing you want to consider when you're developing the NCA, NCAs is um, the amount of, um, not pressure, but just importance put on citable material. Um, I know when I was developing my research, um, if it wasn't highly, highly cited, it was not considered um, good enough to put in the document. And you have to remember, we're at the very cusp in Indian country of developing our own um, citable material. So that's what I have today. I really appreciate the time and opportunity to work with your group. Again, the Institute for Tribal Environmental Professionals, um, they serve all 574 tribes. And in the last 30 years, they served 95% of them. So really, really good um, group to work with and highly recommend. Thank you for your time, Thank you. Thanks very much, Anne-Marie. Okay, uh, questions and discussion, please. Uh, and I'll, I'll watch for our members who are on Zoom only. Marianne. Thank you for that presentation. Um, I had a quick question for you. This comes from um, the time I've spent being an archeologist and anthropologist rather than a climate change planner necessarily, but who controls the dissemination of ITEC? So I know in the past when anthropologists have gone uh, out to tribes, there has been a lot of contested uh, interaction around the exchange of information and the exchange of, of other things. And um, a lot of the contested interaction has been around the, who has the authority to share knowledge, who has the authority to speak to what knowledge. Um, I also know that working at the Albuquerque district, there's a lot of conflict among and between tribes over what knowledge can be shared um, that impedes water resources planning um, on a broader scale. So can you speak to how um, who has who how authority is vested in individual people to speak on climate change issues? Thank you. That's a great question. Thank you. So if you're a researcher and you're working for a university or any other, um, what I recommend is to look, each tribe has an institutional review board that you would go through if you're going to be publishing and researching on tribal lands, right? The Navajo Nation is probably the one of the um, um, largest, I would say, um, institutional review board. So this is for your researchers. So if you're going to go and publish or do any research, in human research, especially, well, both, but um, I would definitely look up um, um, each tribal nations, and some of them you just go through their TIPO office, the Tribal Preservation and Historic Office, but it really depends on what each tribe wants. Now, when it comes to developing proposals and saying, um, uh, so free and prior informed, this is where I say the guidance, um, the guidance for use of traditional and ec um, ecological, traditional ecological knowledges comes in. If you Google that, you will find eight steps into how we developed who you should work with, um, how you should work with them. So each nation has multiple knowledge holders. So that's a big portion of it. Um, 
and say you are looking at, so say for in the Navajo Nation, um, and, and there are different levels of um, uh, sacredness, if you will. Uh, so one medicine person may do speak to you and however, the information that you glean from that person, that person must understand what it's, how it's gonna be used, if it's gonna be published, um, are they paid for it? Um, do they understand it's gonna go into public domain? And more importantly, does that tribe understand that this knowledge holder has now released that information? So I would work very carefully, not only with your knowledge holder, but also your tribal council to make sure a courtesy letter goes to them and say, hey, we're interviewing this individual and, um, and then their tribe will then speak. So again, it, it comes back to the tribal, the leadership. Okay, I wanted to uh, come back to Juan uh, and, and have both Juan and, and Anne-Marie uh, react to this. It's the, what you're telling us, I think, is that the, uh, the participation of underrepresented groups via groups like the Environmental Protection, uh, Pro Professionals Organization and the Union of Concerned Scientists is rising. So it's a very dynamic situation. So just between in the four years that passed between a one uh, a national climate assessment and the next, that there's been a quite noticeable change. So uh, first of all, is that impression correct that that's uh, uh, changing quite rapidly? And then if it is correct, where should NCA6 aim uh, in order to, to keep up with the the changing level of participation and mobilization of these underrepresented groups. Juan, if you, I might start with you. Thank you. Uh, well, I I don't have hard numbers to quantify that, but I would say that you know, anecdotally, from my own perspective, there has been an increase in the interest and uh, um, the resources uh, dedicated or demanded by vulnerable communities or communities, you know, in the front lines of climate change to be engaged to be involved, to the demanding a seat at the table, um, and not coming only as consumers of the information that's being produced, but also as active producers of that knowledge, and more importantly, of the recommendations um, and the policies that will come out um, from that. So um, I then, then, then to answer your, your second question, then I think then future efforts um, of the NCA should take that into account, should create more in um, more open spaces and uh, bake in more time and more resources to uh, foster that engagement in a meaningful way that leads to meaningful engagement with environmental justice, climate justice communities, and other vulnerable communities that um, um, have, as I said earlier, their own community expertise that may be ancestral, that may be historical, that may be environmental. Um, in, in indigenous in the way that uh, that uh, Anne Marie has been uh, talking about um, that um, that are part of of a solution that would strengthen the NCA and the applicability of it. Great, I I raise this question because in thinking about evaluation, we're dealing with a moving baseline that the expectations uh, of performance in NCA five are one thing, but the, presumably the expectations for NCA six would be different in some way or another. And I, we want to get more get more texture on that. Anne-Marie, before we go to that uh, part of the discussion, would you comment on uh, whether things are changing rapidly? Yes, they are. I would see there's more um, uh, authors in this chapter. I would agree with that. Um, one thing I would say is I would love to see uh, uh, an indigenous person in each of the um, the uh, chapters, if not if not that, then or someone from that community, an underrepresented community member in each of the chapters, just because that voice is so important to hear from. Because you're not coming, they're most likely, and and I don't know what the qualifications are for. I'm thinking the chapter leads select their committees, but that should be part of the curriculum, the underlying. Um, curriculum development is having an underrepresented um, community member um, in that. And they don't, again, they don't have to have a PhD. They should just have to know about that 
that topic area um, from their own perspective. And that's circling back really to Ariane's question uh, about uh, legitimacy of voices, uh, because I think that what is distinct about the tribal communities is uh, the claim now accepted by the federal government uh, that tribal communities have access to a different mode of knowing uh, indigenous knowledges that's certified and, uh, and made reliable in a different way than say uh, peer reviewed publications. Uh, and and securing degrees from educational institutions uh, function in in what's usually called Western science. And so the, the question of how you how you determine the sort of the qualifications of people in other underrepresented populations, uh, I think is still an open one and and it's not it's not clear to me uh, you know how to deal with that. Kathy, is your hand up? Yes, I actually want to oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I said, I would recommend speaking with community members and asking for their expert. That's what I, I mean, because like in the indigenous community, we all know who the experts are. So we would then recommend if you, NCAI, or, um, NCA would um, ask these community groups, they would definitely know who the, the leaders are. Thanks, Kathy. Yes, yeah, so as a follow up on that, um, Emery, I wanted to ask you, so uh, uh, many of your comments relate to having greater participation by tribal members in the production of the NCA. So mm -hmm. as authors, for example, um, so we're charged with looking at um, designing a strategy for evaluating the outputs. So mm -hmm. I was wanted to ask you what your thoughts would be on how presumably not having those voice not having those people participating in the production of the product makes the product less useful. And so I guess the question is, how can we get at the ways in which it is not as useful as it could or should be, you know, in, in some sense, by looking at the product as opposed to by looking at the inputs to the product? Do you have any thoughts on how, for us as a committee, how we might try to make sure that we somehow think about um, ways to evaluate the what's missing so that we can incorporate that into our evaluation strategy? I think one of my slides I put a, um, I would say the economic part, because in order to get more assistance to these communities that don't have um, power, don't have identity, or they, they're not seen, is to listen to them and ask them what they need. And, and we've done that in the stock report, the State of Tribes and Climate Change Report. And we base that off to the NCA5. And other communities would do that because they're using, because if then we then look at that chart and say, okay, how much does the coasts, how much does the federal government put into the coasts? How much does it put into oceans? How much does it put into agriculture? subsidized through federal agencies. If we could have that research, and then how much are put into the Hawaiian and US affiliated tribal islands, how much are put into indigenous peoples, you would start seeing the equitable standards that are coming out and whether that input. So tribes put in information, hoping that they will be seen, get more resources, have more assistance contributed to them. That is why they're, they're in the middle of being at the front line of like especially in Alaska, where there's almost 200 Alaskan native villages, they're on the front lines, but they're still participating. It's like putting out a fire and then also participating, saying, how are we going to put out the fire? So their changes are so rapid up there that it's really hard to get them involved with the NCA5 and any of the climate things because they're at the front lines day in and day out trying to survive and then participate and say, how are we gonna survive in five years when today's a hard day? So the, I would say the output should be information that would help them leverage for more resources, more power, more visibility. Juan, go ahead. I, I would like to um, reinforce something that Amory said earlier about the need for in for better and more indigenous representation in the chapter so I, like she pointed out it's a good thing that there's a chapter dedicated to to uh 
uh, to indigenous uh, people in the NCA, but that's not sufficient because most of those sort of chapters um, are going to have impacts. The, the things that are, the topics in those chapters are going to also be issues. You know, uh, there are going to be geographic locations or specific climate impacts or sector impacts that are impacting indigenous communities, and and that they in that um, the inclusion of um, indigenous uh, authors that do not necessarily need to be scientists, right? Um, or, uh, as uh, as Amory said, should be a key part then of making sure that we can understand then holistically how uh, all these climate impacts are, all these climate hazards are impacting indigenous communities. Um, that, that that inclusion of, of that, that process will need to be open and, and we will need to have an expansive definition of what an expert is. That it's not just somebody with a Western, you know, PhD education. I think one thing that I really wanted to contribute to this conversation today is that because I would just say because Indigenous peoples for the last five hundred years have been uh, on the struggle, right? Our resilience, mentally, spiritually, we have we have some serious scars that we can go through new things. So the mental health part is a big part of what we're contributing now. And I'm seeing it in universities across the board. The students that are coming up and starting to acknowledge climate change and start to think about it, the depression rate, the suicide rate, all of those issues that are not talked about other than scientifically are what is a big, a big measure of what indigenous peoples bring. Because for 500 years, we've gone through some pretty harsh federal policies. And so bringing that um, resilience mentally and spiritually is probably one thing that when you bring it into a conversation with scientists, a lot of times this, they'll listen for a second and then they'll be like, okay, that doesn't, doesn't have a metric, that doesn't have, that you can't, can't quantify that, but it's a huge component of what we're gonna be dealing with in the next five to 10 years with this new generation coming in. So, and, we let, and Juan, let me come back to Kathy uh, Segerson's question about uh, how we might try to get at this, because uh, our task is to, is to suggest a strategy for evaluation uh, for the USGCRP to apply, you know, to, so that they can think about how to, apply, how to evaluate the NCA5 uh, just concluded. And one of the less one of the points it seems to me that I'm getting is that uh, underrepresented people in general and uh, indigenous people in particular uh, hold a body of knowledge and experience that is poorly recorded or underrecorded in the scientific record. Uh, and how to get how to quantify that I think is a little difficult. Uh, you know, it's, it's that's that's not a trivial task. But there are, you know, there is a literature that 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 gets at that, uh, as well as you know, partly narratives, uh, of course. But the, it's the skew in the body of scientific understanding that that results from the fact that this part of human experience is not recorded in the same way as uh, for other groups of people. So that's that's something that the that the NCA should take into account in some fashion or other. One way they could do that is to include members of these underrepresented communities in the formulation of the questions that they try to answer. Uh, and they should then they can evaluate whether they did that a good job of that in NCA5. Okay. Uh, and then the the skew in the body of knowledge in turn means that the results, the outputs of the NCA may miss the point uh, of uh, uh, of addressing the needs of various people. So, you, you know, uh, Anne-Marie mentioned the coastal Alaskan communities that are grappling with uh, rapid melting of permafrost. Um, that's a problem that scientists recognize already and the, and the need to relocate communities and so forth is already on the table. And that's, that's not a question where the where the scientific knowledge, the province of the NCA, uh, is in question. Uh, you know, you, you might ask, well, do they cover the, do they, can they predict the uh, areas of collapse 
uh, accurately enough and do they deliver the information to those communities in a timely fashion. But, but that's not a, whether that's happening or not is not a matter of dispute. Uh, it's, that's not a scientific question. So the question, the, so where I think the NCA might, might benefit from is, is for knowledge from these underrepresented communities about other things that are being missed because the knowledge base is, is uh, distorted in this fashion. So those are ways I think that, that I'm, I'm just trying to play out uh, really to brainstorm based on what uh, Kathy asked you about how we, how we carry this kind of theme forward. One, I, I would like to give you an example, um, it not, not a tribal example, obviously, um, but in the case of Puerto Rico after Hurricane Maria in, in, in 2017, um, the narratives around resilience are very much tied to place, to the places where people are, to um, remaining in place, to improving the spatial resolution and reach of the science to understand what parts of what FEMA, of communities, what the FEMA says are going to be, are, are in the flood zone. Well, anecdotally, we know in the communities that some don't. So there may be some in situ relocation, so it's, it's an example, right? That, that, um, um, that maps into what anthropologists, ethnographers, and other social scientists call social capital, you know, staying in place, um, relying on the extended family networks, you know, to build that resilience, the love and historical and ancestral attachment to the place, which is which is not just an emotional attachment. It's a it's a very grounded attachment that has some real material benefits and 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 intergenerational benefits. Um, and um, but but it maps into these other devices that we understand in the social um, and other sciences as part of that, but it transcends that. And that has to be integrated. That has to be known. That has that has to be brought into understanding what otherwise could be construed as um, unscientific or even anti-scientific um, uh, uh, opinions or attitudes towards what the projections say about sea level rise. Right? You know, it's also politics of resistance of folks who have been like the, like the indigenous tribes that Anne-Marie is talking about, who have lived with such bad enduring. So, such terrible enduring and racist conditions and oppression conditions for so long that they are actively resisting what the federal government is saying. You just need to get out of here and leave. Um, and they're resisting that um, and, and trying to build that climate resilience in place. It, there's very little time to unpack that. That's that's very rich and, 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 and deep. But that is what's coming out from the narratives that uh, that the folks that unit concerned scientists work, works with. Um, that, that are, and it's not just limited to, to U.S. Caribbean um, uh, um, uh, places, but other places as well um, where narratives of, of climate resilience are deeply tied into the networks and, com and community tissue that people are resisting uh, the, uh, the, the pull to break those apart. Yes, Heather, go ahead. Yeah, this also makes me think, um, it was so fascinating to hear you, Anna-Marie. Um, it makes me think about the indigenous knowledge as uh, a set of um, data inputs, even though that's not quite what it is in some cases, but it, it, my mind goes to how all of those inputs, scientific and otherwise, um, get coordinated as they feed into the processing of each chapter by the chapter um, committees. And that's certainly a challenge in its own right, just getting data sets uh, nationally and internationally and, and having that at a very technical level, thinking about that coordination. Um, my question is, we can, I, I hear it sort of being almost, uh, well, my question is, how can the indigenous communities and community that um, may come to the table for the NCA on a regular basis and be part of that, um, how much, uh, co discussion has there been on that side in terms of coordinating to be ready to participate in the NCA specifically? Because I think um, there's messaging associated with that. There's the knowledge transfer and of course all of the decision, individual tribal decisions that you laid out that are unique to each tribe perhaps around which knowledge will be shared. Um, and it seems like that's a, that's a big coordination question on the on the tribal side, but also on the side of GCRP as um, an, an enduring partner. 
I think that's a great question. I think that's what the status of tribes and climate change report is about. We actively went out to 34 different um, nations and asked them. I mean, there's still <laughs> 500 or 550 still, or less than 550, but in that range that have not been heard, right? So we try to also include in that report from by region. So, and so when those, um, so you have Alaskan regions represented, Northwest, Southwest, so all the different regions, we try to really be um, specific so that each region would have an example, a narrative with a solution from there. And then it went through their tribal council to get approved so that they're, it's because it's a published document. So they had to go through the whole criteria of not only being cited correctly, but also being going through public um, comment for their community. And then it went through, um, and then it were the National Congress of American Indians is another source um, where that report was um, at least um, introduced. Um, and so that it's, a, so folks are aware of it. Now to use it is another question, right? It's a report. It talks about all these things happening. How do you make a person, and, and you have to remember a lot of tribes don't even have a climate change person on staff. So you're using your water quality person at half time or a third of a time, trying to figure out how to put a tribal adaptation plan together and using the national climate assessment in, in some ways can be very, very scientific and hard, hard to understand. Or another big thing is um, their scope of it doesn't include them. So um, it may be too large, but their scope of that, that doesn't impact them. So trying to, and then what do you do with a climate? One thing we, at the Institute for Tribal Environmental Professionals, one thing we were, we're happy putting together adaptation plans but as soon as we were done with it, we would say, now what? There's no resources <laughs> to implement it. Then we would have to try to um, work with FEMA. So we developed an adaptation plan where FEMA was a part of it so that they could get funding. Again, a lot of this has to turn up where they can leverage the, the information given in NCA5 where they can find resources, more political influence so they can change laws. Those are all things that they need to use in order to help them with their climate issues. And I think Ru Ru has been had his hand up for a while now. Mr. Rouge, I've been uh, neglecting you. I apologize. Uh, go ahead. Uh, yeah, thanks, Anne-Marie. Thank you, Juan. Thank you both for your time and your presentation. The, the question that I have, and I, I think it's partly a question, partly a comment, is um, Anne-Marie, your presentation is making me think that, you know, when we're using the term uh, tribal communities and we're using BIPOC, the term BIPOC, we are kind of talking about a big generic audience and almost kind of treating it as a monolith. So I just want to kind of hear from you and maybe talk a little bit about your institutional knowledge of, um, are there any biases or assumptions that we should be mindful of uh, when we are kind of thinking about uh, tribal communities, especially kind of constrained within the purview of what this committee has been tasked for. Uh, and I'm trying to draw on some of your institutional knowledge here in terms of some of the bottlenecks or some of the biases, assumptions that we should be mindful of when we're kind of thinking about our uh, duties as a committee. So, if you look at tribe, the word tribes in American Indian, it's a political, we are political entities and sovereign nations. I think a lot of folks oversee that. They don't see tribes as sovereign nations that have their own political um, uh, governments. And so when we're working with tribes, it's a very different, um, and then they, a lot of folks think that the federal government funds them quite a bit. Yes, we get healthcare. I wouldn't say it's the best healthcare. Yes, we get education. It's not the best education. If you go on to reserves, and a lot of folks think that gaming has um, impacts everyone or it really helps everyone. It doesn't. Um, a lot of tribes do not have gaming influences. And so, and a lot of um, uh, tribal nations are still living in third world countries. I mean, third world conditions. My nation, a third. A Navajo Nation, we have a third of our people who still have to haul water 
they'll have potable water and that's within 30 miles of where I'm in now. So a, a lot of these things, and, and that can be, and that's we're working with um, folks in the Appalachian region who are very, very, the, the level of poverty that influences and excludes people from these types of surveys where the most impacts are being felt, right? But their voices aren't heard because they don't have access to higher education to get degrees in order to get on these committees. They don't have access to um, people who know. So all of the, the amount of access that is not given and but is not portrayed in these reports is, is critical. So I would say those are some of the things from Indian country that I think people oversee is that when not every tribe is a gaming tribe, even if it's a gaming tribe, they might not be profitable. A lot of countries are still dealing with unemployment rates up to 50%. So again, a lot of these biases are in the socioeconomic issues. Anne, and then I think we're just about out of time, but I'll, why not come back to you? I wanted to ask the two of you to elaborate on the concept of values. I think you're getting really close in the things you've been saying, and I wonder how community values or specific values of specific communities are not being met by large scale outputs of scientific data. Juan, I'll let you go first. <laughs> We're talking about well, um, it's a scientific problem, obviously, because I mean, in part, not not only because a one size fits all sort of research approach to understanding climate impacts, um, climate hazards, and the impacts that they have is not going to be sufficient to characterize all communities. Um, social dynamics are going to be different in every place, in every region. They're going to play out differently in terms of the relationship of those communities. Um, to the federal government, to the regional government, to economic structures, political structures, and so on. So um, when when you get then to values, I hear well, what what is it that people care about? You know, writ large. You know, in terms of you can think about it in terms of infrastructure, uh, things they treasure that could be material things. You know, um, and like you know their schools or their wealth or or, or the things that most people value their family right you know um so um assessing that you know one size fits all national climate assessment that's i think that, that that that's a tall order and 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 i think that i don't necessarily think that the nca should be the place to fully engage all of that because that's um i think there are a lot of roadblocks in terms of process and the role of the federal government in being able to do that um i think there's a role then for um other organizations such as you know concerned scientists and other organizations that work with together with um impacted communities to to help pinpoint what those what those things are and what 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 the climate crisis means to those communities and how to address that um i mean to summarize it's just it's it, it it's a broader sort of problem that doesn't lend itself to being um, approach with a one-size-fits-all um, approach. And Marie, I think you get the last word. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I like that question because um, one of the things that I talk a lot about is seventh generation philosophy. And that is um, what we do today, you should be thinking seven generations forward. And so in our communities, uh, indigenous communities, not only are we thinking seven generations forward about what we're thinking about, but also how do we keep our languages, our songs, our traditional cultures intact for the next seven generations? And with everything that has happened in the last 500 years to erase us and erase our culture, that is something that's critically important. So when people ask about, oh, how do you want to join a group that, you know, everything has to be the same and that we're going to automatically say we're not the same. So allowing people to be unique or groups to be unique and to add that uniqueness to the NCA5 is part of, is, is human, you know? Yes, it's scientific, but it's also the human portion of who we are. And so that, that would be a big value for indigenous peoples. Thank you. And Marie and Juan, thank you both very much. Uh, we are out of time. Uh, and uh, committee, why don't we take a break for a few minutes and then uh, get back together in closed session.